Today's book is 48 Laws of Power. Before we start, please subscribe and like the video to make more videos, and leave book suggestions in the comments. To Anna Biller, and to my parents. R. G. Acknowledgements. First, I would like to thank Anna Biller, who helped edit and research this book, and whose invaluable insights played a critical role in the shape and content of the 48 Laws. Without her, none of this would have been possible. I must also thank my dear friend Mikhail Schwartz who was responsible for involving me in the art school Fabrica in Italy and introducing me there to Joost Elfers, my partner and producer of the 48 Laws of Power. It was in the scheming world of Fabrica that Joost and I saw the timelessness of Machiavelli and from our discussions in Venice, Italy, this book was born. I would like to thank Henri Lugobin, who supplied me with many Machiavellian anecdotes over the years, particularly concerning the numerous French characters who play such a large role in this book. I would also like to thank Les and Sumiko Biller, who lent me their library on Japanese history and helped me with the Japanese tea ceremony. Part of the book. Similarly, I must thank my good friend Elizabeth Yang, who advised me on Chinese history. A book like this depended greatly on the research material available and I am particularly grateful to the UCLA Research Library, I spent many pleasant days wandering through its incomparable collections. My parents, Lorette and Stanley Green, deserve endless thanks for their patience and support. And I must not forget to pay tribute to my cat, Boris, who kept me company throughout the never-ending days of writing. Finally, to those people in my life who have so skillfully used the game of power to manipulate, torture, and cause me pain over the years, I bear you no grudges and I thank you for supplying me with inspiration for the 48 Laws of Power. Robert Greene In addition, we would like to thank Susan Peterson and Barbara Grossman, the Penguin Publishers for believing in this book, Molly Stern, editor, who oversaw the whole project for Viking Penguin. Sophia Mura for her new classic design. David Frankel, for editing the text. Roni Axelrod, Barbara Campo, Jay Zimmet, Joe Eagle, Radha Pancham, Marie Timmel, Michael Fragnito, and Ng San Ko. Robert Green Yost Elfers. Contents. Preface. Law 1 Never outshine the master always make those above you feel comfortably superior. In your desire to please or impress them, do not go too far in displaying your talents or you might accomplish the opposite, inspire fear and insecurity. Make your masters appear more brilliant than they are and you will attain the heights of power. Law 2 Never put too much trust in friends, learn how to use enemies be wary of friends, they will betray you more quickly, for they are easily aroused to envy. They also become spoiled and tyrannical. But hire a former enemy and he will be more loyal than a friend, because he has more to prove. In fact, you have more to fear from friends than from enemies. If you have no enemies, find a way to make them. Law 3 Conceal your intentions Keep people off balance and in the dark by never revealing the purpose behind your actions. If they have no clue what you are up to, they cannot prepare a defense. Guide them far enough down the wrong path envelop them in enough smoke, and by the time they realize your intentions, it will be too late. Law 4 Always say less than necessary when you are trying to impress people with words, the more you say, the more common you appear, and the less in control. Even if you are saying something banal, it will seem original if you make it vague, open-ended. And sphinx-like. Powerful people impress and intimidate by saying less. The more you say, the more likely you are to say something foolish. Law 5 So much depends on reputation, guard it with your life reputation is the cornerstone of power. Through reputation alone you can intimidate and win, once it slips, however, you are vulnerable, and will be attacked on all sides. Make your reputation unassailable. Always be alert to potential attacks and thwart them before they happen. Meanwhile, learn to destroy your enemies by opening holes in their own reputations. Then stand aside and let public opinion hang them. Law 6 Court attention at all cost everything is judged by its appearance, 
what is unseen counts for nothing. Never let yourself get lost in the crowd, then, or buried in oblivion. Stand out. Be conspicuous, at all cost. Make yourself a magnet of attention by appearing larger, more colorful, more mysterious than the bland and timid. Masses. Law 7 Get others to do the work for you, but always take the credit use the wisdom, knowledge, and legwork of other people to further your own cause. Not only will such assistance save you valuable time and energy, it will give you a godlike aura of efficiency and speed. In the end your helpers will be forgotten and you will be remembered. Never do yourself what others can do for you. Law 8 Make other people come to you, use bait if necessary when you force the other person to act, you are the one in control. It is always better to make your opponent come to you, abandoning his own plans in the process. Lure him with fabulous gains, then attack. You hold the cards. Law 9 Win through your actions, never through argument. Any momentary triumph you think you have gained through argument is really a pyrrhic victory, the resentment and ill will you stir up is stronger and lasts longer than any momentary change of opinion. It is much more powerful to get others to agree with you through your actions, without saying a word. Demonstrate, do not explicate. Law 10 Infection Avoid the unhappy and unlucky you can die from someone else's misery, emotional states are as infectious as diseases. You may feel you are helping the drowning man but you are only precipitating your own disaster. The unfortunate sometimes draw misfortune on themselves, they will also draw it on you. Associate with the happy and fortunate instead. Law 11 Learn to keep people dependent on you to maintain your independence you must always be needed and wanted. The more you are relied on, the more freedom you have. Make people depend on you for their happiness and prosperity and you have nothing to fear. Never teach them enough so that they can do without you. Law 12 Use selective honesty and generosity to disarm your victim One sincere and honest move will cover over dozens of dishonest ones. Open-hearted gestures of honesty and generosity bring down the guard of even the most suspicious people. Once your selective honesty opens a hole in their armor, you can deceive and manipulate them at will. A timely gift, a Trojan horse, will serve the same purpose. Law 13 When asking for help, appeal to people's self-interest, never to their mercy or gratitude if you need to turn to an ally for help, do not bother to remind him of your past assistance and good deeds. He will find a way to ignore you. Instead, uncover something in your request, or in your alliance with him, that will benefit him, and emphasize it out of all proportion. He will respond enthusiastically when he sees something to be gained for himself. Law 14 Pose as a friend, work as a spy knowing about your rival is critical. Use spies to gather valuable information that will keep you a step ahead. Better still, play the spy yourself. In polite social encounters, learn to probe. Ask indirect questions to get people to reveal their weaknesses and intentions. There is no occasion that is not an opportunity for artful spying. Law 15 Crush your enemy totally All great leaders since Moses have known that a feared enemy must be crushed completely. Sometimes they have learned this the hard way. If one ember is left alight, no matter how dimly it smolders, a fire will eventually break out. More is lost through stopping halfway than through total annihilation, the enemy will recover, and will seek revenge. Crush him, not only in body but in spirit. Law 16 Use absence to increase respect and honor too much circulation makes the price go down, the more you are seen and heard from, the more common you appear. If you are already established in a group, temporary withdrawal from it will make you more talked about, even more admired. You must learn when to leave. Create value through scarcity. Law 17 Keep others in suspended terror, cultivate an air of unpredictability Humans are creatures of habit with an insatiable need to see familiarity in other people's actions. Your predictability gives them a sense of control. Turn the tables, be deliberately unpredictable. 
Behavior that seems to have no consistency or purpose will keep them off balance, and they will wear themselves out trying to explain your moves. Taken to an extreme, this strategy can intimidate and terrorize. Law 18 Do not build fortresses to protect yourself, isolation is dangerous. The world is dangerous and enemies are everywhere, everyone has to protect themselves. A fortress seems the safest. But isolation exposes you to more dangers than it protects you from, it cuts you off from valuable information, it makes you conspicuous and an easy target. Better to circulate among people, find allies, mingle. You are shielded from your enemies by the crowd. Law 19 Know who you're dealing with, do not offend the wrong person There are many different kinds of people in the world, and you can never assume that everyone will react to your strategies in the same way. Deceive or outmaneuver some people and they will spend the rest of their lives seeking revenge. They are wolves in lambs' clothing. Choose your victims and opponents carefully, then, never offend or deceive the wrong person. Law 20 Do not commit to anyone It is the fool who always rushes to take sides. Do not commit to any side or cause but yourself. By maintaining your independence, you become the master of others, playing people against one another, making them pursue. You. Law 21 Play a sucker to catch a sucker, seem dumber than your mark no one likes feeling stupider than the next person. The trick, then, is to make your victims feel smart, and not just smart, but smarter than you are. Once convinced of this, they will never suspect that you may have ulterior motives. Law 22 Use the surrender tactic, transform weakness into power when you are weaker, never fight for honor's sake, choose surrender instead. Surrender gives you time to recover, time to torment and irritate your conqueror, time to wait for his power to wane. Do not give him the satisfaction of fighting and defeating you, surrender first. By turning the other cheek you infuriate and unsettle him. Make surrender a tool of power. Law 23 Concentrate your forces Conserve your forces and energies by keeping them concentrated at their strongest point. You gain more by finding a rich mine and mining it deeper, than by flitting from one shallow mine to another, intensity defeats extensity every time. When looking for sources of power to elevate you, find the one key patron, the fat cow who will give you milk for a long time to come. Law 24 Play the perfect courtier The perfect courtier thrives in a world where everything revolves around power and political dexterity. He has mastered the art of indirection, he flatters, yields to superiors, and asserts power over others in the most oblique and graceful manner. Learn and apply the laws of courtiership and there will be no limit to how far you can rise in the court. Law 25 RE Create yourself Do not accept the roles that society foists on you. Recreate yourself by forging a new identity, one that commands attention and never bores the audience. Be the master of your own image rather than letting others define it for you. Incorporate dramatic devices into your public gestures and actions, your power will be enhanced and your character will seem larger than life. Law 26 Keep your hands clean You must seem a paragon of civility and efficiency, your hands are never soiled by mistakes and nasty deeds. Maintain such a spotless appearance by using others as scapegoats and cat's paws to disguise your involvement. Law 27 Play on people's need To believe To create a cult-like following People have an overwhelming desire to believe in something. Become the focal point of such desire by offering them a cause, a new faith to follow. Keep your words vague but full of promise, emphasize enthusiasm over. Rationality and clear thinking. Give your new disciples rituals to perform, ask them to make sacrifices on your behalf. In the absence of organized religion and grand causes, your new belief system will bring you untold. Power Law 28 Enter action with boldness If you are unsure of a course of action, do not attempt it. Your doubts and hesitations will infect your execution. Timidity is dangerous, better to enter with boldness. Any mistakes you commit through audacity are easily corrected with more audacity. Everyone admires the bold, no one honors the timid.
Law 29 plan all the way to the END the ending is everything. Plan all the way to it, taking into account all the possible consequences, obstacles, and twists of fortune that might reverse your hard work and give the glory to others. By planning to the end you will not be overwhelmed by circumstances and you will know when to stop. Gently guide fortune and help determine the future by thinking far ahead. Law 30 Make your accomplishments seem effortless Your actions must seem natural and executed with ease. All the toil and practice that go into them, and also all the clever tricks, must be concealed. When you act, act effortlessly, as if you could do much more. Avoid the temptation of revealing how hard you work, it only raises questions. Teach no one your tricks or they will be used against you. Law 31 Control the options, get others to play with the cards you deal The best deceptions are the ones that seem to give the other person a choice, your victims feel they are in control, but are actually your puppets. Give people options that come out in your favor whichever one they choose. Force them to make choices between the lesser of two evils, both of which serve your purpose. Put them on the horns of a dilemma, they are gored wherever they turn. Law 32 Play To People's Fantasies The truth is often avoided because it is ugly and unpleasant. Never appeal to truth and reality unless you are prepared for the anger that comes from disenchantment. Life is so harsh and distressing that people who can manufacture romance or conjure up fantasy are like oases in the desert, everyone flocks to them. There is great power in tapping into the fantasies of the masses. Law 33 Discover each man's THUMBSCREW Everyone has a weakness, a gap in the castle wall. That weakness is usually an insecurity, an uncontrollable emotion or need, it can also be a small secret pleasure. Either way, once found, it is a thumbscrew you can turn to your advantage. Law 34 Be royal in your own fashion, act like a king to be treated like one The way you carry yourself will often determine how you are treated, in the long run, appearing vulgar or common will make people disrespect you. For a king respects himself and inspires the same sentiment in others. By acting regally and confident of your powers, you make yourself seem destined to wear a crown. Law 35 Master the art of timing never seem to be in a hurry, hurrying betrays a lack of control over yourself, and over time. Always seem patient, as if you know that everything will come to you eventually. Become a detective of the right moment, sniff out the spirit of the times, the trends that will carry you to power. Learn to stand back when the time is not yet ripe, and to strike fiercely when it has reached fruition. Law 36 Disdain things you cannot have. Ignoring them is the best revenge by acknowledging a petty problem you give it existence and credibility. The more attention you pay an enemy, the stronger you make him, and a small. Mistake is often made worse and more visible when you try to fix it. It is sometimes best to leave things alone. If there is something you want but cannot have, show contempt for it. The less interest you reveal, the more superior you seem. Law 37 Create compelling spectacles Striking imagery and grand symbolic gestures create the aura of power, everyone responds to them. Stage spectacles for those around you, then, full of arresting visuals and radiant symbols that heighten your presence. Dazzled by appearances, no one will notice what you are really doing. Law 38 Think as you like but behave like others if you make a show of going against the times, flaunting your unconventional ideas and unorthodox ways, people will think that you only want attention and that you look down upon them. They will find a way to punish you for making them feel inferior. It is far safer to blend in and nurture the common touch. Share your originality only with tolerant friends and those who are sure to appreciate your uniqueness. Law 39 Stir up waters to catch fish anger and emotion are strategically counterproductive. You must always stay calm and objective. But if you can make your enemies angry while staying calm yourself, you gain a decided advantage. Put your enemies off balance, find the chink in their vanity through which you can rattle them and you hold the strings. Law 40 Despise the free lunch What is offered for free is dangerous, it usually involves either a trick or a hidden obligation. What has worth is worth paying for. 
By paying your own way you stay clear of gratitude, guilt, and deceit. It is also often wise to pay the full price, there is no cutting corners with excellence. Be lavish with your money and keep it circulating, for generosity is a sign and a magnet for power. Law 41 Avoid stepping into a great man's shoes What happens first always appears better and more original than what comes after. If you succeed a great man or have a famous parent, you will have to accomplish double their achievements to outshine them. Do not get lost in their shadow, or stuck in a past not of your own making, establish your own name and identity by changing course. Slay the overbearing father, disparage his legacy, and gain power by shining in your own way. Law 42 Strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter trouble can often be traced to a single strong individual, the stirrer, the arrogant underling, the poisoner of goodwill. If you allow such people room to operate, others will succumb to their influence. Do not wait for the troubles they cause to multiply, do not try to negotiate with them, they are irredeemable. Neutralize their influence by isolating or banishing them. Strike at the source of the trouble and the sheep will scatter. Law 43 Work on the hearts and minds of others Coercion creates a reaction that will eventually work against you. You must seduce others into wanting to move in your direction. A person you have seduced becomes your loyal pawn. And the way to seduce others is to operate on their individual psychologies and weaknesses. Soften up the resistant by working on their emotions, playing on what they hold dear and what they fear. Ignore the hearts and minds of others and they will grow to hate you. Law 44 Disarm and infuriate with the mirror effect The mirror reflects reality, but it is also the perfect tool for deception. When you mirror your enemies, doing exactly as they do, they cannot figure out your strategy. The mirror effect mocks and humiliates them, making them overreact. By holding up a mirror to their psyches, you seduce them with the illusion that you share their values, by holding up a mirror to their actions, you teach them a lesson. Few can resist the power of the mirror effect. Law 45 Preach the need for change, but never reform too much at once everyone understands the need for change in the abstract, but on the day-to-day -day level people are creatures of habit. Too much innovation is traumatic, and will lead to revolt. If you are new to a position of power, or an outsider trying to build a power base, make a show of respecting the old way of doing things. If change is necessary, make it feel like a gentle improvement on the past. Law 46 Never appear too perfect Appearing better than others is always dangerous, but most dangerous of all is to appear to have no faults or weaknesses. Envy creates silent enemies. It is smart to occasionally display defects, and admit to harmless vices, in order to deflect envy and appear more human and approachable. Only gods and the dead can seem perfect with impunity. Law 47 Do not go past the mark you aimed for, in victory, learn when to stop the moment of victory is often the moment of greatest peril. In the heat of victory, Arrogance and overconfidence can push you past the goal you had aimed for, and by going too far, you make more enemies than you defeat. Do not allow success to go to your head. There is no substitute for strategy and careful planning. Set a goal, and when you reach it, stop. Law 48 Assume FORMLESSNESS by taking a shape, by having a visible plan, you open yourself to attack. Instead of taking a form for your enemy to grasp, keep yourself adaptable and on the move. Accept the fact that nothing is certain and no law is fixed. The best way to protect yourself is to be as fluid and formless as water, never bet on stability or lasting order. Everything changes. Selected Bibliography Index Preface the feeling of having no power over people and events is generally unbearable to us, when we feel helpless we feel miserable. No one wants less power, everyone wants more. In the world today, however, it is dangerous to seem too power hungry, to be overt with your power moves. We have to seem fair and decent. So we need to be subtle, congenial yet cunning, 
democratic yet devious. This game of constant duplicity most resembles the power dynamic that existed in the scheming world of the old aristocratic court. Throughout history, a court has always formed itself around the person in power, king, queen, emperor, leader. The courtiers who filled this court were in an especially delicate position, they had to serve their masters, but if they seemed to fawn, if they curried favor too obviously, the other courtiers around them would notice and would act against them. Attempts to win the master's favor, then, had to be subtle. And even skilled courtiers capable of such subtlety still had to protect themselves from their fellow courtiers, who at all moments were scheming to push them aside. Meanwhile the court was supposed to represent the height of civilization and refinement. Violent or overt power moves were frowned upon, courtiers would work silently and secretly against any among them who used force. This was the courtier's dilemma, while appearing the very paragon of elegance, they had to outweat and thwart their own opponents in the subtlest of ways. The successful courtier learned over time to make all of his moves indirect, if he stabbed an opponent in the back, it was with a velvet glove on his hand and the sweetest of smiles on his face. Instead of using coercion or outright treachery, the perfect courtier got his way through seduction, charm, deception, and subtle strategy, always planning several moves ahead. Life in the court was a never-ending game that required constant vigilance and tactical thinking. It was civilized war. Today we face a peculiarly similar paradox to that of the courtier, everything must appear civilized, decent, democratic, and fair. But if we play by those rules too strictly, if we take them too literally, we are crushed by those around us who are not so foolish. As the great Renaissance diplomat and courtier Niccolò Machiavelli wrote, any man who tries to be good all the time is bound to come to ruin among the great number who are not good. The court imagined itself the pinnacle of refinement, but underneath its glittering surface a cauldron of dark emotions, greed, envy, lust, hatred, boiled and simmered. Our world today similarly imagines itself the pinnacle of fairness, yet the same ugly emotions still stir within us, as they have forever. The game is the same. Outwardly, you must seem to respect the niceties, but inwardly, unless you are a fool, you learn quickly to be prudent, and to do as Napoleon advised, place your iron hand inside a velvet glove. If, like the courtier of times gone by, you can master the arts of indirection, learning to seduce, charm, deceive, and subtly outmaneuver your opponents, you will attain the heights of power. You will be able to make people bend to your will without their realizing what you have done. And if they do not realize what you have done, they will neither resent nor resist you. Courts are, unquestionably, the seats of politeness and good breeding, were they not so, they would be the seats of slaughter and desolation. Those who now smile upon and embrace, would affront and stab, each other, if manners did not interpose. Lord Chesterfield, 1694-1773 To some people the notion of consciously playing power games, no matter how indirect, seems evil, a social, a relic of the past. They believe they can opt out of the game by behaving in ways that have nothing to do with power. You must beware of such people, for while they express such opinions outwardly, they are often among the most adept players at power. They utilize strategies that cleverly disguise the nature of the manipulation involved. These types, for example, will often display their weakness and lack of power as a kind of moral virtue. But true powerlessness, without any motive of self-interest, would not publicize its weakness to gain sympathy or respect. Making a show of one's weakness is actually a very effective strategy, subtle and deceptive, in the game of power, See Law 22, The Surrender Tactic. There is nothing very odd about lambs disliking birds of prey, but this is no reason for holding it against large birds of prey that they carry off lambs. And when the lambs whisper among themselves, these birds of prey are evil, and does this not give us a right to say that whatever is the opposite of a bird of prey must be good, there is nothing intrinsically wrong with such an argument, though the birds of prey will look somewhat quizzically and say, we have nothing against these good lambs, 
in fact, we love them, nothing tastes better than a tender lamb. Friedrich Nietzsche, 1844-1900 Another strategy of the supposed non-player is to demand equality in every area of life. Everyone must be treated alike, whatever their status and strength. But if, to avoid the taint of power, you attempt to treat everyone equally and fairly, you will confront the problem that some people do certain things better than others. Treating everyone equally means ignoring their differences, elevating the less skillful and suppressing those who excel. Again, many of those who behave this way are actually deploying another power strategy, redistributing people's rewards in a way that they determine. Yet another way of avoiding the game would be perfect honesty and straightforwardness, since one of the main techniques of those who seek power is deceit and secrecy. But being perfectly honest will inevitably hurt and insult a great many people, some of whom will choose to injure you in return. No one will see your honest statement as completely objective and free of some personal motivation. And they will be right, in truth, the use of Honesty is indeed a power strategy, intended to convince people of one's noble, good-hearted, selfless character. It is a form of persuasion, even a subtle form of coercion. Finally, those who claim to be non-players may affect an air of naivete, to protect them from the accusation that they are after power. Beware again, however, for the appearance of naivete can be an effective means of deceit, see Law 21, seem dumber than your mark. And even genuine naivete is not free of the snares of power. Children may be naive in many ways, but they often act from an elemental need to gain control over those around them. Children suffer greatly from feeling powerless in the adult world, and they use any means available to get their way. Genuinely innocent people may still be playing for power, and are often horribly effective at the game, since they are not hindered by reflection. Once again, those who make a show or display of innocence are the least innocent of all. The only means to gain one's ends with people are force and cunning. Love also, they say, but that is to wait for sunshine, and life needs every moment. Johann von Goethe, 1749-1832 You can recognize these supposed non-players by the way they flaunt their moral qualities, their piety, their exquisite sense of justice. But since all of us hunger for power, and almost all of our actions are aimed at gaining it, the non-players are merely throwing dust in our eyes, distracting us from their power plays with their air of moral superiority. If you observe them closely, you will see in fact that they are often the ones most skillful at indirect manipulation, even if some of them practice it unconsciously. And they greatly resent any publicizing of the tactics they use every day. The arrow shot by the archer may or may not kill a single person. But stratagems devised by a wise man can kill even babes in the womb. Kautilya, Indian philosopher, 3rd century BC If the world is like a giant scheming court and we are trapped inside it, there is no use in trying to opt out of the game. That will only render you powerless, and powerlessness will make you miserable. Instead of struggling against the inevitable, Instead of arguing and whining and feeling guilty, it is far better to excel at power. In fact, the better you are at dealing with power, the better friend, lover, husband, wife, and person you become. By following the route of the perfect courtier, see Law 24, you learn to make others feel better about themselves, becoming a source of pleasure to them. They will grow dependent on your abilities and desirous of your presence. By mastering the 48 laws in this book, you spare others the pain that comes from bungling with power, by playing with fire without knowing its properties. If the game of power is inescapable, better to be an artist than a denier or a bungler. Learning the game of power requires a certain way of looking at the world, a shifting of perspective. It takes effort and years of practice, for much of the game may not come naturally. Certain basic skills are required, and once you master these skills you will be able to apply the laws of power more easily. The most important of these skills, and power's crucial foundation, is the ability to master your emotions. An emotional response to a situation is the single greatest barrier to power, 
a mistake that will cost you a lot more than any temporary satisfaction you might gain by expressing your feelings. Emotions cloud reason, and if you cannot see the situation clearly, you cannot prepare for and respond to it with any degree of control. Anger is the most destructive of emotional responses, for it clouds your vision the most. It also has a ripple effect that invariably makes situations less controllable and heightens your enemy's resolve. If you are trying to destroy an enemy who has hurt you, far better to keep him off guard by feigning friendliness than showing your anger. Love and affection are also potentially destructive, in that they blind you to the often self-serving interests of those whom you least suspect of playing a power game. You cannot repress anger or love, or avoid feeling them, and you should not try. But you should be careful about how you express them, and most important, they should never influence your plans and strategies in any way. I thought to myself with what means, with what deceptions, with how many varied arts, with what industry a man sharpens his wits to deceive another, and through these variations the world is made more beautiful. Francesco Vittori, contemporary and friend of Machiavelli, early 16th century. Related to mastering your emotions is the ability to distance yourself from the present moment and think objectively about the past and future. Like Janus, the double-faced Roman deity and guardian of all gates and doorways, you must be able to look in both directions at once, the better to handle danger from wherever it comes. Such is the face you must create for yourself, one face looking continuously to the future and the other to the past. For the future, the motto is, no days unalert. Nothing should catch. You by surprise because you are constantly imagining problems before they arise. Instead of spending your time dreaming of your plan's happy ending, you must work on calculating every possible permutation and pitfall that might emerge in it. The further you see, the more steps ahead you plan, the more powerful you become. The other face of Janus looks constantly to the past, though not to remember past hurts or bear grudges. That would only curb your power. Half of the game is learning how to forget those events in the past that eat away at you and cloud your reason. The real purpose of the backward glancing eye is to educate yourself constantly, you look at the past to learn from those who came before you. The many historical examples in this book will greatly help that process. Then, having looked to the past, you look closer at hand, to your own actions and those of your friends. This is the most vital school you can learn from, because it comes from personal experience. There are no principles, there are only events. There is no good and bad, there are only circumstances. The superior man espouses events and circumstances in order to guide them. If there were principles and fixed laws, nations would not change them as we change our shirts and a man cannot be expected to be wiser than an entire nation. Honoré de Balzac, 1799-1850 You begin by examining the mistakes you have made in the past, the ones that have most grievously held you back. You analyze them in terms of the 48 laws of power, and you extract from them a lesson and an oath, I shall never repeat such a mistake. I shall never fall into such a trap again. If you can evaluate and observe yourself in this way, you can learn to break the patterns of the past, an immensely valuable skill. Power requires the ability to play with appearances. To this end you must learn to wear many masks and keep a bag full of deceptive tricks. Deception and masquerade should not be seen as ugly or immoral. All human interaction requires deception on many levels, and in some ways what separates humans from animals is our ability to lie and deceive. In Greek myths, in India's Mahabharata cycle, in the Middle Eastern epic of Gilgamesh, it is the privilege of the gods to use deceptive arts, a great man, Odysseus for instance, was judged by his ability to rival the craftiness of the gods, stealing some of their divine power by matching them in wits and deception. Deception is a developed art of civilization and the most potent weapon in the game of power. You cannot succeed at deception unless you take a somewhat distanced approach to yourself, unless you can be many different people, wearing the mask that the day and the moment require. 
With such a flexible approach to all appearances, including your own, you lose a lot of the inward heaviness that holds people down. Make your face as malleable as. The actors, work to conceal your intentions from others, practice luring. People into traps. Playing with appearances and mastering arts of deception are among the aesthetic pleasures of life. They are also key components in the acquisition of power. If deception is the most potent weapon in your arsenal, then patience in all things is your crucial shield. Patience will protect you from making moronic blunders. Like mastering your emotions, patience is a skill, it does not come naturally. But nothing about power is natural, power is more godlike than anything in the natural world. And patience is the supreme virtue of the gods, who have nothing but time. Everything good will happen, the grass will grow again, if you give it time and see several steps into the future. Impatience, on the other hand, only makes you look weak. It is a principal impediment to power. Power is essentially amoral and one of the most important skills to acquire is the ability to see circumstances rather than good or evil. Power is A game, this cannot be repeated too often, and in games you do not judge. Your opponents by their intentions but by the effect of their actions. You measure their strategy and their power by what you can see and feel. How often are someone's intentions made the issue only to cloud and deceive? What does it matter if another player, your friend or rival, intended good things and had only your interests at heart, if the effects of his action lead to so much ruin and confusion? It is only natural for people to cover up their actions with all kinds of justifications, always assuming that they have acted out of goodness. You must learn to inwardly laugh each time you hear this and never get caught up engaging someone's intentions and actions through a set of moral judgments that are really an excuse for the accumulation of power. It is a game. Your opponent sits opposite you. Both of you behave as gentlemen or ladies, observing the rules of the game and taking nothing personally. You play with a strategy and you observe your opponent's moves with as much calmness as you can muster. In the end, you will appreciate the politeness of those you are playing with more than their good and sweet intentions. Train your eye to follow the results of their moves, the outward circumstances, and do not be distracted by anything else. Half of your mastery of power comes from what you do not do, what you do not allow yourself to get dragged into. For this skill you must learn to judge all things by what they cost you. As Nietzsche wrote, the value of a thing sometimes lies not in what one attains with it, but in what one pays for it, what it costs us. Perhaps you will attain your goal, and a worthy goal at that, but at what price? Apply this standard to everything, including whether to collaborate with other people or come to their aid. In the end, life is short, opportunities are few, and you have only so much energy to draw on. And in this sense time is as important a consideration as any other. Never waste valuable time, or mental peace of mind, on the affairs of others, that is too high a price to pay. Power is a social game. To learn and master it, you must develop the ability to study and understand people. As the great 17th century thinker and courtier Baltasar Gratian wrote, many people spend time studying the properties of animals or herbs, how much more important it would be to study those of people, with whom we must live or die. To be a master player you must also be a master psychologist. You must recognize motivations and see through the cloud of dust with which people surround. Their actions. An understanding of people's hidden motives is the single greatest piece of knowledge you can have in acquiring power. It opens up endless possibilities of deception, seduction, and manipulation. People are of infinite complexity and you can spend a lifetime watching them without ever fully understanding them. So it is all the more important, then, to begin your education now. In doing so you must also keep one principle in mind, never discriminate as to whom you study and whom you trust. Never trust anyone completely and study everyone, including friends and loved ones. Finally, you must learn always to take the indirect route to power. Disguise your cunning. 
Like a billiard ball that caroms several times before it hits its target, your moves must be planned and developed in the least obvious way. By training yourself to be indirect, you can thrive in the modern court, appearing the paragon of decency while being the consummate manipulator. Consider the 48 Laws of Power a kind of handbook on the arts of indirection. The laws are based on the writings of men and women who have studied and mastered the game of power. These writings span a period of more than 3,000 years and were created in civilizations as disparate as ancient China and Renaissance Italy, yet they share common threads and themes, together hinting at an essence of power that has yet to be fully articulated. The 48 laws of power are the distillation of this accumulated wisdom, gathered from the writings of the most illustrious strategists, Sun Tzu, Clausewitz, Statesman, Bismarck, Talleyrand, Courtiers, Castiglione, Gratian, Seducers, Ninon de L'Enclo, Casanova, and con artists, Yellow Kid, while, in history. The laws have a simple premise, certain actions almost always increase one's power, the observance of the law, while others decrease it and even ruin us, the transgression of the law. These transgressions and observances are illustrated by historical examples. The laws are timeless and definitive. The 48 laws of power can be used in several ways. By reading the book straight through you can learn about power in general. Although several of the laws may seem not to pertain directly to your life, in time you will probably find that all of them have some application, and that in fact they are interrelated. By getting an overview of the entire subject you will best be able to evaluate your own past actions and gain a greater degree of control over your immediate affairs. A thorough reading of the book will inspire thinking and re-evaluation long after you finish it. The book has also been designed for browsing and for examining the law that seems at that particular moment most pertinent to you. Say you are experiencing problems with a superior and cannot understand why your efforts have not lead to more gratitude or a promotion. Several laws specifically address the master-underling relationship, and you are almost certainly transgressing one of them. By browsing the initial paragraphs for the 48 laws in the table of contents, you can identify the pertinent law. Finally, the book can be browsed through and picked apart for Entertainment for an enjoyable ride through the foibles and great deeds of our predecessors in power. A warning, however, to those who use the book for this purpose, it might be better to turn back. Power is endlessly seductive and deceptive in its own way. It is a labyrinth, your mind becomes consumed with solving its infinite problems, and you soon realize how pleasantly lost you have become. In other words, it becomes most amusing by taking it seriously. Do not be frivolous with such a critical matter. The gods of power frown on the frivolous, they give ultimate satisfaction only to those who study and reflect, and punish those who skim the surfaces looking for a good time. Any man who tries to be good all the time is bound to come to ruin among the great number who are not good. Hence a prince who wants to keep his authority must learn how not to be good, and use that knowledge, or refrain from using it, as necessity requires. The Prince, Niccolo Machiavelli, 1469-1527 Law 1. Never outshine the master. Judgment always make those above you feel comfortably superior. In your desire to please and impress them, do not go too far in displaying your talents or you might accomplish the opposite, inspire fear and insecurity. Make your masters appear more brilliant than they are and you will attain the heights of power. Transgression of the Law Nicolas Fouquet, Louis XIV's finance minister in the first years of his reign, was a generous man who loved lavish parties, pretty women, and poetry. He also loved money, for he led an extravagant lifestyle. Fouquet was clever and very much indispensable to the king, so when the prime minister, Jules Mazarin, died, in 1661, the finance minister expected to be named the successor. Instead, the king decided to abolish the position. This and other signs made Fouquet suspect that he was falling out of favor, and so he decided to ingratiate himself with the king by staging the most spectacular party the world had ever seen. 
The party's ostensible purpose would be to commemorate the completion of Fouquet's chateau, Box le Vicomte, but its real function was to pay tribute to the king, the guest of honor. The most brilliant nobility of Europe and some of the greatest minds of the time, La Fontaine, La Rochefoucauld, Madame de Savine, attended. The Party Moliere wrote a play for the occasion, in which he himself was to perform at the evening's conclusion. The party began with a lavish seven-course dinner, featuring foods from the Orient never before tasted in France, as well as new dishes created especially for the night. The meal was accompanied with music commissioned by Fouquet to honor the king. After dinner there was a promenade through the chateau's gardens. The grounds and fountains of Vaux le Vicomte were to be the inspiration for Versailles. Fouquet personally accompanied the young king through the geometrically aligned arrangements of shrubbery and flower beds. Arriving at the garden's canals, they witnessed a fireworks display, which was followed by the performance of Moliere's play. The party ran well into the night and everyone agreed it was the most amazing affair they had ever attended. The next day, Fouquet was arrested by the king's head musketeer, D'Artagnan. Three months later he went on trial for stealing from the country's treasury. Actually, most of the stealing he was accused of he had done on the king's behalf and with the king's permission. Fouquet was found guilty and sent to the most isolated prison in France, high in the Pyrenees Mountains, where he spent the last twenty years of his life in solitary confinement. Interpretation Louis XIV, the Sun King, was a proud and arrogant man who wanted to be the center of attention at all times, he could not countenance being outdone in lavishness by anyone, and certainly not his finance minister. To succeed Fouquet, Louis chose Jean-Baptiste Colbert, a man famous for his parsimony and for giving the dullest parties in Paris. Colbert made sure that any money liberated from the treasury went straight into Louis's hands. With the money, Louis built a palace even more magnificent than Fouquet's, the glorious Palace of Versailles. He used the same architects, decorators, and garden designer. And at Versailles, Louis hosted parties even more extravagant than the one that cost Fouquet his freedom. Let us examine the situation. The evening of the party, as Fouquet presented spectacle on spectacle to Louis, each more magnificent than the one before, he imagined the affair as demonstrating his loyalty and devotion to the king. Not only did he think the party would put him back in the king's favor, he thought it would show his good taste, his connections, and his popularity, making him indispensable to the king and demonstrating that he would make an excellent prime minister. Instead, however, each new spectacle, each appreciative smile bestowed by the guests on Fouquet, made it seem to Louis that his own friends and subjects were more charmed by the finance minister than by the king himself, and that Fouquet was actually flaunting his wealth and power. Rather than flattering Louis XIV, Fouquet's elaborate party offended the king's vanity. Louis would not admit this to anyone, of course, instead, he found a convenient excuse to rid himself of a man who had inadvertently made him feel insecure. Such is the fate, in some form or other, of all those who unbalance the master's sense of self, poke holes in his vanity, or make him doubt his preeminence. When the evening began, Fouquet was at the top of the world. By the time it had ended, he was at the bottom. Voltaire, 1694-1778 Observance of the law in the early 1600s, the Italian astronomer and mathematician Galileo found himself in a precarious position. He depended on the generosity of great rulers to support his research, and so, like all Renaissance scientists, he would sometimes make gifts of his inventions and discoveries to the leading patrons of the time. Once, for instance, he presented a military compass he had invented to the Duke of Gonzaga. Then he dedicated a book explaining the use of the compass to the Medicis. Both rulers were grateful, and through them Galileo was able to find more students to teach. No matter how great the discovery, however, his patrons usually paid him with gifts, not cash. This made for a life of constant insecurity and dependence. There must be an easier way, he thought. Galileo hit on a new strategy in 1610, when he discovered the moons of Jupiter. 
instead of dividing the discovery among his patrons, giving one. The telescope he had used, dedicating a book to another, and so on, as he had done in the past, he decided to focus exclusively on the Medicis. He chose the Medicis for one reason, shortly after Cosimo I had established the Medici dynasty, in 1540, he had made Jupiter, the mightiest of the gods, the Medici symbol, a symbol of a power that went beyond politics and banking, one linked to ancient Rome and its divinities. Galileo turned his discovery of Jupiter's moons into a cosmic event honoring the Medici's greatness. Shortly after the discovery, he announced that, the bright stars, the moons of Jupiter, offered themselves in the heavens, to his telescope at the same time as Cosimo II's enthronement. He said that the number of the moons, for, harmonized with the number of the Medicis, Cosimo II had three brothers, and that the moons orbited Jupiter as these four suns revolved around Cosimo I, the dynasty's founder. More than coincidence, this showed that the heavens themselves reflected the ascendancy of the Medici family. After he dedicated the discovery to the Medicis, Galileo commissioned an emblem representing Jupiter sitting on a cloud with the four stars circling about him, and presented this to Cosimo II as a symbol of his link to the stars. In 1610 Cosimo II made Galileo his official court philosopher and mathematician, with a full salary. For a scientist this was the coup of a lifetime. The days of begging for patronage were over. Interpretation in one stroke, Galileo gained more with his new strategy than he had in years of begging. The reason is simple, all masters want to appear more brilliant than other people. They do not care about science or empirical truth or the latest invention, they care about their name and their glory. Galileo gave the Medicis infinitely more glory by linking their name with cosmic forces than he had by making them the patrons of some new scientific gadget or discovery. Scientists are not spared the vagaries of court life and patronage. They too must serve masters who hold the purse strings. And their great intellectual powers can make the master feel insecure, as if he were only there to supply the funds, an ugly, ignoble job. The producer of a great work wants to feel he is more than just the provider of the financing. He wants to appear creative and powerful, and also more important than the work produced in his name. Instead of insecurity you must give him glory. Galileo did not challenge the intellectual authority of the Medicis with his discovery, or make them feel inferior in any way, by literally aligning them with the stars, he made them shine brilliantly among the courts of Italy. He did not outshine the master, he made the master outshine all others. Keys to power everyone has insecurities. When you show yourself in the world and display your talents, you naturally stir up all kinds of resentment, envy, and other manifestations of insecurity. This is to be expected. You cannot spend your life worrying about the petty feelings of others. With those above you, however, you must take a different approach, when it comes to power, outshining the master is perhaps the worst mistake of all. Do not fool yourself into thinking that life has changed much since the days of Louis XIV and the Medicis. Those who attain high standing in life are like kings and queens, they want to feel secure in their positions, and superior to those around them in intelligence, wit, and charm. It is a deadly but common misperception to believe that by displaying and vaunting your gifts and talents, you are winning the master's affection. He may feign appreciation, but at his first opportunity he will replace you with someone less intelligent, less attractive, less threatening, just as Louis XIV replaced the sparkling Fouquet with the bland Colbert. And as with Louis, he will not admit the truth, but will find an excuse to rid himself of your presence. This law involves two rules that you must realize. First, you can inadvertently outshine a master simply by being yourself. There are masters who are more insecure than others, monstrously insecure, you may naturally outshine them by your charm and grace. No one had more natural talents than Astor Manfredi, Prince of Fianza. The most handsome of all the young princes of Italy, he captivated his subjects with his generosity and open spirit. In the year 1500, Cesare Borgia laid siege to Faenza. 
When the city surrendered, the citizens expected the worst from the cruel Borja, who, however, decided to spare the town, he simply occupied its fortress, executed none of its citizens, and allowed Prince Manfredi, 18 at the time, to remain with his court, in complete freedom. A few weeks later, though, soldiers hauled a store Manfredi away to a Roman prison. A year after that, his body was fished out of the river Tiber, a stone tied around his neck. Borgia justified the horrible deed with some sort of trumped-up charge of treason and conspiracy, but the real problem was that he was notoriously vain and insecure. The young man was outshining him without even trying. Given Manfredi's natural talents, the prince's mere presence made Borja seem less attractive and charismatic. The lesson is simple, if you cannot help being charming and superior, you must learn to avoid such monsters of vanity. Either that, or find a way to mute your good qualities when in the company of a Cesare Borgia. Second, never imagine that because the master loves you, you can do anything you want. Entire books could be written about favorites who fell out of favor by taking their status for granted, for daring to outshine. In late 16th century Japan, the favorite of Emperor Hideyoshi was a man called Sen no Rikyu. The premier artist of the tea ceremony, which had become an obsession with the nobility, he was one of Hideyoshi's most trusted advisors, had his own apartment in the palace, and was honored throughout Japan. Yet in 1591, Hideyoshi had him arrested and sentenced to death. Rikyu took his own life, instead. The cause for his sudden change of fortune was discovered later, it seems that Rikyu, former peasant and later court favorite, had had a wooden statue made of himself wearing sandals, a sign of nobility, and posing loftily. He had had this statue placed in the most important temple inside the palace gates, in clear sight of the royalty who often would pass by. To Hideyoshi this signified that Rikyu had no sense of limits. Presuming that he had the same rights as those of the highest nobility, he had forgotten that his position depended on the emperor, and had come to believe that he had earned it on his own. This was an unforgivable miscalculation of his own importance and he paid for it with his life. Remember the following, never take your position for granted and never let any favors you receive go to your head. Knowing the dangers of outshining your master, you can turn this law to your advantage. First you must flatter and puff up your master. Overt flattery can be effective but has its limits, it is too direct and obvious, and looks bad to other courtiers. Discreet flattery is much more powerful. If you are more intelligent than your master, for example, seem the opposite, make him appear more intelligent than you. Act naive. Make it seem that you need his expertise. Commit harmless mistakes that will not hurt you in the long run but will give you the chance to ask for his help. Masters adore such requests. A master who cannot bestow on you the gifts of his experience may direct rancor and ill will at you instead. If your ideas are more creative than your masters, ascribe them to him, in as public a manner as possible. Make it clear that your advice is merely an echo of his advice. If you surpass your master in wit, it is okay to play the role of the court jester, but do not make him appear cold and surly by comparison. Tone down your humor if necessary, and find ways to make him seem the dispenser of amusement and good cheer. If you are naturally more sociable and generous than your master, be careful not to be the cloud that blocks his radiance from others. He must appear as the sun around which everyone revolves, radiating power and brilliance, the center of attention. If you are thrust into the position of entertaining him, a display of your limited means may win you his sympathy. Any attempt to impress him with your grace and generosity can prove fatal, learn from Fouquet or pay the price. In all of these cases it is not a weakness to disguise your strengths if in the end they lead to power. By letting others outshine you, you remain in control, instead of being a victim of their insecurity. This will all come in handy the day you decide to rise above your inferior status. If, like Galileo, you can make your master shine even more in the eyes of others, then you are a godsend and you will be instantly promoted. 
Image, the stars in the sky. There can be only one sun at a time. Never obscure the sunlight, or rival the sun's brilliance, rather, fade into the sky and find ways to heighten the master star's intensity. Authority, avoid outshining the master. All superiority is odious, but the superiority of a subject over his prince is not only stupid, it is fatal. This is a lesson that the stars in the sky teach us, they may be related to the sun, and just as brilliant, but they never appear in her company. Balthasar Gratian, 1601-1658 Reversal You cannot worry about upsetting every person you come across, but you must be selectively cruel. If your superior is a falling star, there is nothing to fear from outshining him. Do not be merciful. Your master had no such scruples in his own cold-blooded climb to the top. Gauge his strength. If he is weak, discreetly hasten his downfall, outdo, outcharm, outsmart him at key moments. If he is very weak and ready to fall, let nature take its course. Do not risk outshining a feeble superior, it might appear cruel or spiteful. But if your master is firm in his position, yet you know yourself to be the more capable, bide your time and be patient. It is the natural course of things that power eventually fades and weakens. Your master will fall someday, and if you play it right, you will outlive and someday outshine him. Law 2. Never put too much trust in friends. Learn how to use enemies. Judgment be wary of friends, they will betray you more quickly, for they are easily aroused to envy. They also become spoiled and tyrannical. But hire a former enemy and he will be more loyal than a friend, because he has more to prove. In fact, you have more to fear from friends than from enemies. If you have no enemies, find a way to make them. Transgression of the law in the mid-9th century AD, a young man named Michael III assumed the throne of the Byzantine Empire. His mother, the Empress Theodora, had been banished to a nunnery, and her lover, Theoctistus, had been murdered, at the head of the conspiracy to depose Theodora and enthrone Michael had been Michael's uncle, Bardas, a man of intelligence and ambition. Michael was now a young, inexperienced ruler, surrounded by intriguers, murderers, and profligates. In this time of peril he needed someone he could trust as his counselor, and his thoughts turned to Basil Ius, his best friend. Basilius had no experience whatsoever in government and politics, in fact, he was the head of the royal stables, but he had proven his love and gratitude time and again. To have a good enemy, choose a friend, he knows where to strike. Diane de Poitiers, 1499-1566, mistress of Henri II of France. They had met a few years before, when Michael had been visiting the stables just as a wild horse got loose. Basilius, a young groom from peasant Macedonian stock, had saved Michael's life. The groom's strength and courage had impressed Michael, who immediately raised Basilius from the obscurity of being a horse trainer to the position of head of the stables. He loaded his friend with gifts and favors and they became inseparable. Basilius was sent to the finest school in Byzantium, and the crude peasant became a cultured and sophisticated courtier. Every time I bestow a vacant office I make a hundred discontented persons and one ingrate. Louis XIV, 1638-1715 Now Michael was emperor, and in need of someone loyal. Who could he better trust with the post of chamberlain and chief counselor than a young man who owed him everything? Basilius could be trained for the job and Michael loved him like a brother. Ignoring the advice of those who recommended the much more. Qualified Bardas, Michael chose his friend. Thus for my own part one have more than once been deceived by the person I loved most and of whose love, above everyone else's, I have been most confident. So that I believe that it may be right to love and serve one person above all others, according to merit and worth, but never to trust so much in this tempting trap of friendship as to have cause to repent of it later on. Baldassare Castiglione, 1478-1529 Basilius learned well and was soon advising the emperor on all matters of state. The only problem seemed to be money, 
Basilius never had enough. Exposure to the splendor of Byzantine court life made him avaricious for the perks of power. Michael doubled, then tripled his salary, ennobled him, and married him off to his own mistress, Eudoxia Injurina. Keeping such a trusted friend and advisor satisfied was worth any price. But more trouble was to come. Bardas was now head of the army, and Basilius convinced Michael that the man was hopelessly ambitious. Under the illusion that he could control his nephew, Bardas had conspired to put him on the throne, and he could conspire again, this time to get rid of Michael and assume the crown himself. Basilius poured poison into Michael's ear until the emperor agreed to have his uncle murdered. During a great horse race, Basilius closed in on Bardas in the crowd and stabbed him to death. Soon after, Basilius asked that he replace Bardas as head of the army, where he could keep control of the realm and quell rebellion. This was granted. Now Basilius's power and wealth only grew, and a few years later Michael, in financial straits from his own extravagance, asked him to pay back some of the money he had borrowed over the years. To Michael's shock and astonishment, Basilius refused, with a look of such impudence that the emperor suddenly realized his predicament, the former stable boy had more money, more allies in the army and senate, and in the end more power than the emperor himself. A few weeks later, after a night of heavy drinking, Michael awoke to find himself surrounded by soldiers. Basilius watched as they stabbed the emperor to death. Then, after proclaiming himself emperor, he rode his horse through the streets of Byzantium, brandishing the head of his former benefactor and best friend at the end of a long pike. The snake, the farmer, and the heron a snake chased by hunters asked a farmer to save its life. To hide it from its pursuers, the farmer squatted and let the snake crawl into his belly. But when the danger had passed and the farmer asked the snake to come out, the snake refused. It was warm and safe inside. On his way home, the man saw a heron and went up to him and whispered what had happened. The heron told him to squat and strain to eject the snake. When the snake snuck its head out, the heron caught it, pulled it out, and killed it. The farmer was worried that the snake's poison might still be inside him, and the heron told him that the cure for snake poison was to cook and eat six white fowl. You're a white fowl, said the farmer. You'll do for a start. He grabbed the heron, put it in a bag, and carried it home, where he hung it up while he told his wife what had happened. I'm surprised at you, said the wife. The bird does you a kindness, rids you of the evil in your belly. Saves your life in fact, yet you catch it and talk of killing it. She immediately released the heron, and it flew away. But on its way, it gouged out her eyes. Moral, when you see water flowing uphill, it means that someone is repaying a kindness. African Folk Tale Interpretation Michael III staked his future on the sense of gratitude he thought Basilius must feel for him. Surely Basilius would serve him best, he owed the emperor his wealth, his education, and his position. Then, once Basilius was in power, anything he needed it was best to give to him, strengthening the bonds between the two men. It was only on the fateful day when the emperor saw that impudent smile on Basilius's face that he realized his deadly mistake. He had created a monster. He had allowed a man to see power up close, a man who then wanted more, who asked for anything and got it, who felt encumbered by the charity he had received and simply did what many people do in such a situation, they forget the favors they have received and imagine they have earned their success by their own merits. At Michael's moment of realization, he could still have saved his own life, but friendship and love blind every man to their interests. Nobody believes a friend can betray. And Michael went on disbelieving until the day. His head ended up on a pike. Lord, protect me from my friends, I can take care of my enemies. Voltaire, 1694-1778 Observance of the law for several centuries after the fall of the Han Dynasty, AD 222, Chinese history followed the same pattern of violent and bloody coups, one after the other. Army men would plot to kill a weak emperor, 
then would replace him on the dragon throne with a strong general. The general would start a new dynasty and crown himself emperor, to ensure his own survival he would kill off his fellow generals. A few years later, however, the pattern would resume, new generals would rise up and assassinate him or his sons in their turn. To be emperor of China was to be alone, surrounded by a pack of enemies, it was the least powerful, least secure position in the realm. In AD 959, General Chao Kuanyin became Emperor Sung. He knew the odds, the probability that within a year or two he would be murdered, how could he break the pattern? Soon after becoming emperor, Sung ordered a banquet to celebrate the new dynasty, and invited the most powerful commanders in the army. After they had drunk much wine, he dismissed the guards and everybody else except the generals, who now feared he would murder them in one fell swoop. Instead, he addressed them, the whole day is spent in fear, and I am unhappy both at the table and in my bed. For which one of you does not dream of ascending the throne? I do not doubt your allegiance, but if by some chance your subordinates, seeking wealth and position, were to force the emperor's yellow robe upon you in turn, how could you refuse it? Drunk and fearing for their lives, the generals proclaimed their innocence and their loyalty. But Sung had other ideas, the best way to pass one's days is in peaceful enjoyment of riches and honor. If you are willing to give up your commands, I am ready to provide you with fine estates and beautiful dwellings where you may take your pleasure with singers and girls as your companions. There are many who think therefore that a wise prince ought, when he has the chance, to foment astutely some enmity, so that by suppressing it he will augment his greatness. Princes, and especially new ones, have found more faith and more usefulness in those men, whom at the beginning of their power they regarded with suspicion, than in those they at first confided in. Pandolfo Petrucci, Prince of Siena, governed his state more by those whom he suspected than by others. Niccolò Machiavelli, 1469-1527 The astonished generals realized that instead of a life of anxiety and struggle Sung was offering them riches and security. The next day, all of the generals tendered their resignations, and they retired as nobles to the estates that Sung bestowed on them. In one stroke, Sung turned a pack of friendly wolves, who would likely have betrayed him, into a group of docile lambs, far from all power. Over the next few years Sung continued his campaign to secure his rule. In AD 971, King Lu of the Southern Han finally surrendered to him after years of rebellion. To Lu's astonishment, Sung gave him a rank in the imperial court and invited him to the palace to seal their newfound friendship with wine. As King Lu took the glass that Sung offered him, he hesitated, fearing it contained poison. Your subjects' crimes certainly merit death, he cried out, but I beg your majesty to spare your subjects' life. Indeed I dare not drink this wine. Emperor Sung laughed, took the glass. From Lu, and swallowed it himself. There was no poison. From then on Lu became his most trusted and loyal friend. At the time, China had splintered into many smaller kingdoms. When Ch Yen Shu, the king of one of these, was defeated, Sung's ministers advised the emperor to lock this rebel up. They presented documents proving that he was still conspiring to kill Sung. When Ch Yen Shu came to visit the emperor, however, Instead of locking him up, Sung honored him. He also gave him a package, which he told the former king to open when he was halfway home. Ch Yen Shu opened the bundle on his return journey and saw that it contained all the papers documenting his conspiracy. He realized that Sung knew of his murderous plans, yet had spared him nonetheless. This generosity won him over, and he too became one of Sung's most loyal vassals. A Brahmin, a great expert in Veda who has become a great archer as well, offers his services to his good friend, who is now the king. The Brahmin cries out when he sees the king, Recognize me, your friend. The king answers him with contempt and then explains, Yes, we were friends before, but our friendship was based on what power we had, I was friends with you, good Brahmin, because it served my purpose. No pauper is friend to the rich, no fool to the wise, no coward to the brave. An old friend, who needs him. 
It is two men of equal wealth and equal birth who contract friendship and marriage, not a rich man and a pauper. An old friend, who needs him. The Mahabharata, c. 3rd century BC. Interpretation A Chinese proverb compares friends to the jaws and teeth of a dangerous animal, if you are not careful, you will find them chewing you up. Emperor Sung knew the jaws he was passing between when he assumed the throne, his friends in the army would chew him up like meat, and if he somehow survived, his friends in the government would have him for supper. Emperor Sung would have no truck with friends, he bribed his fellow generals with splendid estates and kept them far away. This was a much better way to emasculate them than killing them, which would only have led other generals to seek vengeance. And Sung would have nothing to do with friendly ministers. More often than not, they would end up drinking his famous cup of poisoned wine. Instead of relying on friends, Sung used his enemies, one after the other, transforming them into far more reliable subjects. While a friend expects more and more favors, and seethes with jealousy, these former enemies expected nothing and got everything. A man suddenly spared the guillotine. Is a grateful man indeed, and will go to the ends of the earth for the man who has pardoned him. In time, these former enemies became Sung's most trusted friends. And Sung was finally able to break the pattern of coups, violence, and civil war, the Sung dynasty ruled China for more than 300 years. Pick up a bee from kindness, and learn the limitations of kindness. Sufi Proverb In a speech Abraham Lincoln delivered at the height of the Civil War, he referred to the Southerners as fellow human beings who were in error. An elderly lady chastised him for not calling them irreconcilable enemies who must be destroyed. Why, madam, Lincoln replied, do I not destroy my enemies when I make them my friends? Keys to power it is natural to want to employ your friends when you find yourself in times of need. The world is a harsh place, and your friends soften the harshness. Besides, you know them. Why depend on a stranger when you have a friend at hand? Men are more ready to repay an injury than a benefit, because gratitude is a burden and revenge a pleasure. Tacitus, c. A.D. 55-120 the problem is that you often do not know your friends as well as you imagine. Friends often agree on things in order to avoid an argument. They cover up their unpleasant qualities so as to not offend each other. They laugh extra hard at each other's jokes. Since honesty rarely strengthens friendship, you may never know how a friend truly feels. Friends will say that they love your poetry, adore your music, envy your taste in clothes, maybe they mean it often they do not. When you decide to hire a friend, you gradually discover the qualities he or she has kept hidden. Strangely enough, it is your act of kindness that unbalances everything. People want to feel they deserve their good fortune. The receipt of a favor can become oppressive, it means you have been chosen because you are a friend, not necessarily because you are deserving. There is almost a touch of condescension in the act of hiring friends that secretly afflicts them. The injury will come out slowly, a little more. Honesty, flashes of resentment and envy here and there, and before you know it your friendship fades. The more favors and gifts you supply to revive the friendship, the less gratitude you receive. Ingratitude has a long and deep history. It has demonstrated its powers for so many centuries, that it is truly amazing that people continue to Underestimate them. Better to be wary. If you never expect gratitude from a friend, you will be pleasantly surprised when they do prove grateful. Profiting by our enemies King Hiero chanced upon a time, speaking with one of his enemies, to be told in a reproachful manner that he had stinking breath. Whereupon the good king, being somewhat dismayed in himself, as soon as he returned home chided his wife, how does it happen that you never told me of this problem? The woman, being a simple, chaste, and harmless dame, said, Sir, I had thought all men's breath had smelled so. Thus it is plain that faults that are evident to the senses, 
gross and corporal, or otherwise notorious to the world, we know by our enemies sooner than by our friends and familiars. Plutarch, C. A. D. 46-120 The problem with using or hiring friends is that it will inevitably limit your power. The friend is rarely the one who is most able to help you, and in the end, skill and competence are far more important than friendly feelings. Michael III had a man right under his nose who would have steered him right and kept him alive, that man was Bardas. All working situations require a kind of distance between people. You are trying to work, not make friends, friendliness, real or false, only obscures that fact. The key to power, then, is the ability to judge who is best able to further your interests in all situations. Keep friends for friendship, but work with the skilled and competent. Your enemies, on the other hand, are an untapped gold mine that you must learn to exploit. When Talleyrand, Napoleon's foreign minister, decided in 1807 that his boss was leading France to ruin, and the time had come to turn against him, he understood the dangers of conspiring against. The emperor, he needed a partner, a confederate, what friend could he trust? In such a project, he chose Joseph Fouché, head of the secret police, his most hated enemy, a man who had even tried to have him assassinated. He knew that their former hatred would create an opportunity for an emotional reconciliation. He knew that Fouché would expect nothing from him, and in fact would work to prove that he was worthy of Talleyrand's choice, a person who has something to prove will move mountains for you. Finally, he knew that his relationship with Fouché would be based on mutual self-interest, and would not be contaminated by personal feeling. The Selection Proved perfect, although the conspirators did not succeed in toppling Napoleon, the union of such powerful but unlikely partners generated much interest in the cause, opposition to the emperor slowly began to spread. And from then on, Talleyrand and Fouché had a fruitful working relationship. Whenever you can, bury the hatchet with an enemy, and make a point of putting him in your service. As Lincoln said, you destroy an enemy when you make a friend of him. In 1971, during the Vietnam War, Henry Kissinger was the target of an unsuccessful kidnapping attempt, a conspiracy involving, among others, the renowned anti-war activist priests the Berrigan brothers, four more Catholic priests, and four nuns. In private, without informing the Secret Service or the Justice Department, Kissinger arranged a Saturday morning meeting with three of the alleged kidnappers. Explaining to his guests that he would have most American soldiers out of Vietnam by mid-1972, he completely charmed them. They gave him some, kidnap Kissinger, buttons and one of them remained a friend of his for years, visiting him on several occasions. This was not just a one-time ploy, Kissinger made a policy of working with those who disagreed with him. Colleagues commented that he seemed to get along better with his enemies than with his friends. Without enemies around us, we grow lazy. An enemy at our heels sharpens our wits, keeping us focused and alert. It is sometimes better, then, to use enemies as enemies rather than transforming them into friends or allies. Mao Zedong saw conflict as key in his approach to power. In 1937 the Japanese invaded China, interrupting the civil war between Mao's communists and their enemy, the nationalists. Fearing that the Japanese would wipe them out, some communist leaders advocated leaving the nationalists to fight the Japanese, and using the time to recuperate. Mao disagreed, the Japanese could not possibly defeat and occupy a vast country like China for long. Once they left, the Communists would have grown rusty if they had been out of combat for several years, and would be ill-prepared to reopen their struggle with the nationalists. To fight a formidable foe like the Japanese, in fact, would be the perfect training for the communists' ragtag army. Mao's plan was adopted, and it worked, by the time the Japanese finally retreated, the communists had gained the fighting experience that helped them defeat the nationalists. Years later, a Japanese visitor tried to apologize to Mao for his country's invasion of China. Mao interrupted, should I not thank you instead? Without a worthy opponent, he explained, 
a man or group cannot grow stronger. Mao's strategy of constant conflict has several key components. First, be certain that in the long run you will emerge victorious. Never pick a fight with someone you are not sure you can defeat, as Mao knew the Japanese would be defeated in time. Second, if you have no apparent enemies, you must sometimes set up a convenient target, even turning a friend into an enemy. Mao used this tactic time and again in politics. Third, use such enemies to define your cause more clearly to the public, even framing it as a struggle of good against evil. Mao actually encouraged China's disagreements with the Soviet Union and the United States, without clear-cut enemies, he believed, his people would lose any sense of what Chinese communism meant. A sharply defined enemy is a far stronger argument for your side than all the words you could possibly put together. Never let the presence of enemies upset or distress you, you are far better off with a declared opponent or two than not knowing where your real enemies lie. The man of power welcomes conflict, using enemies to enhance his reputation as a sure-footed fighter who can be relied upon in times of uncertainty. Image, the jaws of ingratitude. Knowing what would happen if you put a finger in the mouth of a lion, you would stay clear of it. With friends you will have no such caution, and if you hire them, they will eat you alive with ingratitude. Authority, know how to use enemies for your own profit. You must learn to grab a sword not by its blade, which would cut you, but by the handle. Which allows you to defend yourself. The wise man profits more from his enemies, than a fool from his friends. Baltasar Gratian, 1601-1658 Reversal Although it is generally best not to mix work with friendship, there are times when a friend can be used to greater effect than an enemy. A man of power, for example, often has dirty work that has to be done, but for the sake of appearances it is generally preferable to have other people do it for him, friends often do this the best, since their affection for him makes them willing to take chances. Also, if your plans go awry for some reason, you can use a friend as a convenient scapegoat. This, fall of the favorite, was a trick often used by kings and sovereigns, they would let their closest friend at court take the fall for a mistake, since the public would not believe that they would deliberately sacrifice a friend for such a purpose. Of course, after you play that card, you have lost your friend forever. It is best, then, to reserve the scapegoat role for someone who is close to you but not too close. Finally, the problem about working with friends is that it confuses the boundaries and distances that working requires. But if both partners in the arrangement understand the dangers involved, a friend often can be employed to great effect. You must never let your guard down in such a venture, however, always be on the lookout for any signs of emotional disturbance such as envy and ingratitude. Nothing is stable in the realm of power, and even the closest of friends can be transformed into the worst of enemies. Law 3. Conceal your intentions Judgment keep people off balance and in the dark by never revealing the purpose behind your actions. If they have no clue what you are up to, they cannot prepare a defense. Guide them far enough down the wrong path, envelop them in enough smoke, and by the time they realize your intentions, it will be too late. Part 1. Use decoyed objects of desire and red herrings to throw people off the scent if at any point in the deception you practice people have the slightest suspicion as to your intentions, all is lost. Do not give them the chance to sense what you are up to, throw them off the scent by dragging red herrings across the path. Use false sincerity, send ambiguous signals, set up misleading objects of desire. Unable to distinguish the genuine from the false, they cannot pick out your real goal. Transgression of the law over several weeks, Ninon de Lanclo, the most infamous courtesan of 17th century France, listened patiently as the Marquis de Savine explained his struggles in pursuing a beautiful but difficult young countess. Ninon was 62 at the time, and more than experienced in matters of love, the Marquis was a lad of 22, handsome, dashing, but hopelessly inexperienced in romance. At first Ninon was amused to hear the Marquis talk about his mistakes, but finally she had had enough. 
Unable to bear ineptitude in any realm, least of all in seducing a woman, she decided to take the young man under her wing. First, he had to understand that this was war, and that the beautiful countess was a citadel to which he had to lay siege as carefully as any general. Every step had to be planned and executed with the utmost attention to detail and nuance. Instructing the Marquis to start over, Ninan told him to approach the Countess with a bit of distance, an air of nonchalance. The next time the two were alone together, she said, he would confide in the Countess as would a friend but not a potential lover. This was to throw her off the scent. The Countess was no longer to take his interest in her for granted, perhaps he was only interested in friendship. Ninan planned ahead. Once the Countess was confused, it would be time to make her jealous. At the next encounter, at a major fete in Paris, the Marquis would show up with a beautiful young woman at his side. This beautiful young woman had equally beautiful friends, so that wherever the Countess would now see the Marquis, he would be surrounded by the most stunning young women in Paris. Not only would the Countess be seething with jealousy, she would come to see the Marquis as someone who was desired by others. It was hard for Ninon to make the Marquis understand, but she patiently explained that a woman who is interested in a man wants to see that other women are interested in him, too. Not only does that give him instant value, it makes it all the more satisfying to snatch him from their clutches. Once the Countess was jealous but intrigued, it would be time to beguile her. On Ninan's instructions, the Marquis would fail to show up at affairs where the Countess expected to see him. Then, suddenly, he would appear at salons he had never frequented before, but that the Countess attended often. She would be unable to predict his moves. All of this would push her into the state of emotional confusion that is a prerequisite for successful seduction. These moves were executed, and took several weeks. Ninon monitored the Marquis's progress, through her network of spies, she heard how the Countess would laugh a little harder at his witticisms, listen more closely to his stories. She heard that the Countess was suddenly asking questions about him. Her friends told her that at social affairs the Countess would often look up at the Marquis, following his steps. Ninon felt certain that the young woman was falling under his spell. It was a matter of weeks now, maybe a month or two, but if all went smoothly, the citadel would fall. A few days later the Marquis was at the Countess's home. They were alone. Suddenly he was a different man, this time acting on his own impulse, rather than following Ninon's instructions, he took the Countess's hands and told her he was in love with her. The young woman seemed confused, a reaction he did not expect. She became polite, then excused herself. For the rest of the evening she avoided his eyes, was not there to say goodnight to him. The next few times he visited he was told she was not at home. When she finally admitted him again, the two felt awkward and uncomfortable with each other. The spell was broken. Interpretation Ninon de Lanclo knew everything about the art of love. The greatest writers, thinkers, and politicians of the time had been her lovers, men like La Rochefoucauld, Moliere, and Richelieu. Seduction was a game to her, to be practiced with skill. As she got older, and her reputation grew, the most important families in France would send their sons to her to be instructed in matters of love. Nina knew that men and women are very different, but when it comes to seduction they feel the same, deep down inside, they often sense when they are being seduced, but they give in because they enjoy the feeling of being led along. It is a pleasure to let go, and to allow the other person to deter you into a strange country. Everything in seduction, however, depends on suggestion. You cannot announce your intentions or reveal them directly in words. Instead you must throw your targets off the scent. 2. Surrender to your guidance they must be appropriately confused. You have to scramble your signals, appear interested in another man or woman, the decoy, then hint at being interested in the target, then feign indifference, on and on. Such patterns not only confuse, they excite. 
Imagine this story from the Countess's perspective, after a few of the Marquis's moves, she sensed the Marquis was playing some sort of game, but the game delighted her. She did not know where he was leading her, but so much the better. His moves intrigued her, each of them keeping her waiting for the next one, she even enjoyed her jealousy and confusion, for sometimes any emotion is better than the boredom of security. Perhaps the Marquis had ulterior motives, most men do. But she was willing to wait and see, and probably if she had been made to wait long enough, what he was up to would not have mattered. The moment the Marquis uttered that fatal word, love, however, all was changed. This was no longer a game with moves, it was an artless show. Of passion. His intention was revealed, he was seducing her. This put. Everything he had done in a new light. All that before had been charming now seemed ugly and conniving, the Countess felt embarrassed and used. A door closed that would never open again. Do not be held a cheat, even though it is impossible to live today without being one. Let your greatest cunning lie in covering up what looks like cunning. Baltasar Gratian, 1601-1658 Observance of the law in 1850 The young Otto von Bismarck, then a 35-year-old deputy in the Prussian parliament, was at a turning point in his career. The issues of the day were the unification of the many states, including Prussia, into which Germany was then divided, and a war against Austria, the powerful neighbor to the south that hoped to keep the Germans weak and at odds, even threatening to intervene if they tried to unite. Prince William, next in line to be Prussia's king, was in favor of going to war, and the parliament rallied to the cause, prepared to back any mobilization of troops. The only ones to oppose war were the present king, Frederick William IV, and his ministers, who preferred to appease the powerful Austrians. Throughout his career, Bismarck had been a loyal, even passionate supporter of Prussian might and power. He dreamed of German unification, of going to war against Austria and humiliating the country that, for so long, had kept Germany divided. A former soldier, he saw warfare as a glorious business. This, after all, was the man who years later would say, the great questions of the time will be decided, not by speeches and resolutions, but by iron and blood. Passionate patriot and lover of military glory, Bismarck nevertheless gave a speech in Parliament at the height of the war fever that astonished all who heard it. Woe unto the statesman, he said, who makes war without a reason that will still be valid when the war is over. After the war, you will all look differently at these questions. Will you then have the courage to turn to the peasant contemplating the ashes of his farm, to the man who has been crippled, to the father who has lost his children? Not only did Bismarck go on to talk of the madness of this war, but, strangest of all, he praised Austria and defended her actions. This went against everything he had stood for. The consequences were immediate. Bismarck was against the war, what could this possibly mean? Other deputies were confused, and several of them changed their votes. Eventually the king and his ministers won out, and war was averted. A few weeks after Bismarck's infamous speech, the king, grateful that he had spoken for peace, made him a cabinet minister. A few years later he became the Prussian premier. In this role he eventually led his country and a peace-loving king into a war against Austria, crushing the former empire and establishing a mighty German state, with Prussia at its head. Interpretation at the time of his speech in 1850, Bismarck made several calculations. First, he sensed that the Prussian military, which had not kept pace with other European armies, was unready for war, that Austria, in fact, might very well win, a disastrous result for the future. Second, if the war were lost and Bismarck had supported it, his career would be gravely jeopardized. The king and his conservative ministers wanted peace, Bismarck wanted power. The answer was to throw people off the scent by supporting a cause he detested, saying things he would laugh at if said by another. A whole country was fooled. It was because of Bismarck's speech that the king made him a minister, 
a position from which he quickly rose to be prime minister, attaining the power to strengthen the Prussian military and accomplish what he had wanted all along, the humiliation of Austria and the unification of Germany under Prussia's leadership. Bismarck was certainly one of the cleverest statesmen who ever lived, a master of strategy and deception. No one suspected what he was up to in this case. Had he announced his real intentions, arguing that it was better to wait now and fight later, he would not have won the argument, since most Prussians wanted war at that moment and mistakenly believed that their army was superior to the Austrians. Had he played up to the king, asking to be made a minister in exchange for supporting peace, he would not have succeeded either, the king would have distrusted his ambition and doubted his sincerity. By being completely insincere and sending misleading signals, however, he deceived everyone, concealed his purpose, and attained everything he wanted. Such is the power of hiding your intentions. Keys to power Most people are open books. They say what they feel, blurt out their opinions at every opportunity, and constantly reveal their plans and intentions. They do this for several reasons. First, it is easy and natural to always want to talk about one's feelings and plans for the future. It takes effort to control your tongue and monitor what you reveal. Second, many believe that by being honest and open they are winning people's hearts and showing their good nature. They are greatly deluded. Honesty is actually a blunt instrument, which bloodies more than it cuts. Your honesty is likely to offend people, it is much more prudent to tailor your words, telling people what they want to hear rather than the coarse and ugly truth of what you feel or think. More important, by being unabashedly open you make yourself so predictable and familiar that it is almost impossible to respect or fear you, and power will not accrue to a person who cannot inspire such emotions. If you yearn for power, quickly lay honesty aside, and train yourself in. The Art of Concealing Your Intentions Master the art and you will always have the upper hand. Basic to an ability to conceal one's intentions is a simple truth about human nature, our first instinct is to always trust appearances. We cannot go around doubting the reality of what we see and hear, constantly imagining that appearances concealed something else would exhaust and terrify us. This fact makes it relatively easy to conceal one's intentions. Simply dangle an object you seem to desire, a goal you seem to aim for, in front of people's eyes and they will take the appearance for reality. Once their eyes focus on the decoy, they will fail to notice what you are really up to. In seduction, set up conflicting signals, such as desire and indifference, and you not only throw them off the scent, you inflame their desire to possess you. A tactic that is often effective in setting up a red herring is to appear to support an idea or cause that is actually contrary to your own sentiments. Bismarck used this to great effect in his speech in 1850. Most people will believe you have experienced a change of heart, since it is so unusual to play so lightly with something as emotional as one's opinions and values. The same applies for any decoyed object of desire, seem to want something in which you are actually not at all interested and your enemies will be thrown off the scent, making all kinds of errors in their calculations. During the War of the Spanish Succession in 1711, the Duke of Marlborough, head of the English army, wanted to destroy a key French fort, because it protected a vital thoroughfare into France. Yet he knew that if he destroyed it, the French would realize what he wanted, to advance down that road. Instead, then, he merely captured the fort, and garrisoned it. With some of his troops, making it appear as if he wanted it for some purpose of his own. The French attacked the fort and the Duke let them recapture it. Once they had it back, though, they destroyed it, figuring that the Duke had wanted it for some important reason. Now that the fort was gone, the road was unprotected, and Marlborough could easily march into France. Use this tactic in the following manner, hide your intentions not by closing up, with the risk of appearing secretive, and making people suspicious, but by talking endlessly about your desires and goals, just not your real ones. You will kill three birds with one stone, you appear friendly, open, and trusting, you conceal your intentions, and you send your rivals on time-consuming wild goose chases. 
Another powerful tool in throwing people off the scent is false sincerity. People easily mistake sincerity for honesty. Remember, their first instinct is to trust appearances, and since they value honesty and want to believe in the honesty of those around them, they will rarely doubt you or see through your act. Seeming to believe what you say gives your words great weight. This is how Iago deceived and destroyed Othello, given the depth of his emotions, the apparent sincerity of his concerns about Desdemona's supposed infidelity, how could Othello distrust him? This is also how the great con artist Yellow Kid while pulled the wool over Sucker's eyes, seeming to believe so deeply in the decoyed object he was dangling in front of them, a phony stock, a touted racehorse, he made its reality hard to doubt. It is important, of course, not to go too far in this area. Sincerity is a tricky tool, appear overpassionate and you raise suspicions. Be measured and believable or your ruse will seem the put on that it is. To make your false sincerity an effective weapon in concealing your intentions, espouse a belief in honesty and forthrightness as important social values. Do this as publicly as possible. Emphasize your position on this subject by occasionally divulging some heartfelt thought, though only one that is actually meaningless or irrelevant, of course. Napoleon's minister Talleyrand was a master at taking people into his confidence by revealing some apparent secret. This feigned confidence, a decoy, would then elicit a real confidence on the other person's part. Remember, the best deceivers do everything they can to cloak their roguish qualities. They cultivate an air of honesty in one area to disguise their dishonesty in others. Honesty is merely another decoy in their arsenal of weapons. Part 2 Use smoke screens to disguise your actions. Deception is always the best strategy, but the best deceptions require a screen of smoke to distract people's attention from your real purpose. The bland exterior, like the unreadable poker face, is often the perfect smoke screen, hiding your intentions behind the comfortable and familiar. If you lead the sucker down a familiar path, he won't catch on when you lead him into a trap. Observance of the Law I in 1910, a Mr. Sam Giesel of Chicago sold his warehouse business for close to $1 million. He settled down to semi-retirement and the managing of his many properties, but deep inside he itched for the old days of deal-making. One day a young man named Joseph Wilde visited his office, wanting to buy an apartment he had up for sale. Giesel explained the terms, the price was $8,000, but he only required a down payment of $2,000. Wilde said he would sleep on it, but he came back the following day and offered to pay the full $8,000 in cash, if Giesel could wait a couple of days, until a deal Wilde was working on came through. Even in semi-retirement, a clever businessman like Giesel was curious as to how Wilde would be able to come up with so much cash, roughly $150,000 today, so quickly. Wilde seemed reluctant to say, and quickly changed the subject, but Giesel was persistent. Finally, after assurances of confidentiality, Wilde told Giesel the following story. Jehu, king of Israel, Fain's worship of the idol Baal then Jehu assembled all the people, and said to them, Ahab served Baal a little, but Jehu will serve him much more. Now therefore call to me all the prophets of Baal, all his worshippers and all his priests, let none be missing, for I have a great sacrifice to offer to Baal, whoever is missing shall not live. But Jehu did it with cunning in order to destroy the worshippers of Baal. And Jehu ordered, sanctify a solemn assembly for Baal. So they proclaimed it. And Jehu sent throughout all Israel, and all the worshippers of Baal came, so that there was not a man left who did not come. And they entered the house of Baal, and the house of Baal was filled from one end to the other. Then Jehu went into the house of Baal, and he said to the worshippers of Baal, Search, and see that there is no servant of the Lord here among you but only the worshippers of Baal. Then he went in to offer sacrifices and burnt offerings. Now, Jehu had stationed eighty men outside, and said, The man who allows any of those whom I give into your hands to escape shall forfeit his life. 
So as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, Jehu said to the guard and to the officers, Go in and slay them, let not a man escape. So when they put them to the sword, the guard and the officers cast them out and went into the inner room of the house of Baal and they brought out the pillar that was in the house of Baal and burned it. And they demolished the pillar of Baal and demolished the house of Baal, and made it a latrine to this day. Thus Jehu wiped out Baal from Israel. Old Testament, 2 Kings 10 verses 18-28 Weil's uncle was the secretary to a coterie of multimillionaire financiers. These wealthy gentlemen had purchased a hunting lodge in Michigan ten years ago, at a cheap price. They had not used the lodge for a few years, so they had decided to sell it and had asked Wiles' uncle to get whatever he could for it. For reasons, good reasons, of his own, the uncle had been nursing a grudge against the millionaires for years, this was his chance to get back at them. He would sell the property for $35,000 to a setup man, whom it was Wiles' job to find. The financiers were too wealthy to worry about this low price. The setup man would then turn around and sell the property again for its real price, around $155,000. The uncle, while, and the third man would split the profits from this second sale. It was all legal and for a good cause, the uncle's just retribution. Giesel had heard enough, he wanted to be the setup buyer. While was reluctant to involve him, but Giesel would not back down, the idea of a Large profit, plus a little adventure, had him champing at the bit. While explained that Giesel would have to put up the $35,000 in cash to bring the deal off. Giesel, a millionaire, said he could get the money with a snap of his fingers. While finally relented and agreed to arrange a meeting between the uncle, Giesel, and the financiers, in the town of Galesburg, Illinois. On the train ride to Galesburg, Giesel met the uncle, an impressive man, with whom he avidly discussed business. While also brought along a companion, a somewhat paunchy man named George Gross. While explained to Giesel that he himself was a boxing trainer, that Gross was one of the promising prize fighters he trained, and that he had asked Gross to come along to make sure the fighter stayed in shape. For a promising fighter, Gross was unimpressive looking, he had gray hair and a beer belly, but Giesel was so excited about the deal that he didn't really think about the man's flabby appearance. Once in Galesburg, Weil and his uncle went to fetch the financiers while Giesel waited in a hotel room with Gross, who promptly put on his boxing trunks. As Giesel half-watched, Gross began to shadowbox. Distracted as He was, Giesel ignored how badly the boxer wheezed after a few minutes of Exercise, although his style seemed real enough. An hour later, while and his uncle reappeared with the financiers, an impressive, intimidating group of men, all wearing fancy suits. The meeting went well and the financiers agreed to sell the lodge to Giesel, who had already had the $35,000 wired to a local bank. This minor business now settled, the financiers sat back in their chairs and began to banter about high finance, throwing out the name, J.P. Morgan, as if they knew the man. Finally one of them noticed the boxer in the corner of the room. While explained what he was doing there. The financier countered that he too had a boxer in his entourage, whom he named. While laughed brazenly and exclaimed that his man could easily knock out their man. Conversation escalated into argument. In the heat of passion, while challenged the men to a bet. The financiers eagerly agreed and left to get their man ready for a fight the next day. As soon as they had left, the uncle yelled at Weil, right in front of Giesel, they did not have enough money to bet with, and once the financiers discovered this, the uncle would be fired. Weil apologized for getting him in this mess, but he had a plan, he knew the other boxer well. And with a little bribe, they could fix the fight. But where would the money come from for the bet? The uncle replied. Without it they were as good as dead. Finally Giesel had heard enough. Unwilling to jeopardize his deal with any ill will, he offered his own $35,000 cash for part of the bet. Even if he lost that, 
he would wire for more money and still make a profit on the sale of the lodge. The uncle and nephew thanked him. With their own $15,000 and Giesel's $35,000 they would manage to have enough for the bet. That evening, as Giesel watched the two boxers rehearse the fix in the hotel room, his mind reeled at the killing he was going to make from both the boxing match and the sale of the lodge. The fight took place in a gym the next day. While handled the cash, which was placed for security in a locked box. Everything was proceeding as planned in the hotel room. The financiers were looking glum at how badly their fighter was doing, and Giesel was dreaming about the easy money he was about to make. Then, suddenly, a wild swing by the financier's fighter hit Gross hard in the face, knocking him down. When he hit the canvas, blood spurted from his mouth. He coughed, then lay still. One of the financiers, a former doctor, checked his pulse, he was dead. The millionaires panicked, everyone had to get out before the police arrived, they could all be charged with murder. Sneak across the ocean in broad daylight this means to create a front that eventually becomes imbued with an atmosphere or impression of familiarity, within which the strategist may maneuver unseen while all eyes are trained to see obvious familiarities. The 36 strategies, quoted in the Japanese Art of War, Thomas Cleary, 1991. Terrified, Giesel hightailed it out of the gym and back to Chicago, leaving behind his $35,000 which he was only too glad to forget, for it seemed a small price to pay to avoid being implicated in a crime. He never wanted to see Weil or any of the others again. After Giesel scurried out, Gross stood up, under his own steam. The blood that had spurted from his mouth came from a ball filled with chicken blood and hot water that he had hidden in his cheek. The whole affair had been masterminded by Weil, better known as the Yellow Kid, one of the most creative con artists in history. While split the $35,000 with the financiers and the boxers, all fellow con artists, a nice little profit for a few days' work. Interpretation The Yellow Kid had staked out Giesel as the perfect sucker long before he set up the con. He knew the boxing match scam would be the perfect ruse to separate Giesel from his money quickly and definitively. But he also knew that if he had begun by trying to interest Giesel in the boxing match, he would have failed miserably. He had to conceal his intentions and switch attention, create a smoke screen, in this case the sale of the lodge. On the train ride and in the hotel room Giesel's mind had been completely occupied with the pending deal, the easy money, the chance to hobnob with wealthy men. He had failed to notice that Gross was out of shape and middle-aged at best. Such is the distracting power of a smoke screen. Engrossed in the business deal, Giesel's attention was easily diverted to the boxing match, but only at a point when it was already too late for him to notice the details that would have given Gross away. The match, after all, now depended on a bribe rather than on the boxers. Physical condition and Giesel was so distracted at the end by the illusion of the boxer's death that he completely forgot about his money. Learn from the yellow kid, the familiar, inconspicuous front is the perfect smoke screen. Approach your mark with an idea that seems ordinary enough, a business deal, financial intrigue. The sucker's mind is distracted, his suspicions allayed. That is when you gently guide him onto the second path, the slippery slope down which he slides helplessly into your trap. Observance of the law too in the mid-1920s, the powerful warlords of Ethiopia were coming to the realization that a young man of the nobility named Haile Selassie, also known as Rastafari, was outcompeting them all and nearing the point where he could proclaim himself their leader, unifying the country for the first time in decades. Most of his rivals could not understand how this wispy, quiet, mild-mannered man had been able to take control. Yet in 1927, Selassie was able to summon the warlords, one at a time, to come to Addis Ababa to declare their loyalty and recognize him as leader. Some hurried, some hesitated, but only one, the Jasmic Balchav Sidamo, dared defy Selassie totally. A blustery man, Balchav was a great warrior, 
and he considered the new leader weak and unworthy. He pointedly stayed away from the capital. Finally Selassie, in his gentle but stern way, commanded Balcha to come. The warlord decided to obey, but in doing so he would turn the tables on this pretender to the Ethiopian throne, he would come to Addis Ababa at his own speed, and with an army of 10,000 men, a force large enough to defend himself, perhaps even start a civil war. Stationing this formidable force in a valley three miles from the capital, he waited, as a king would. Selassie would have to come to him. Selassie did indeed send emissaries, asking Balcha to attend an afternoon banquet in his honor. But Balcha, no fool, knew history, he knew that previous kings and lords of Ethiopia had used banquets as a trap. Once he was there and full of drink, Selassie would have him arrested or murdered. To signal his understanding of the situation, he agreed to come to the banquet, but only if he could bring his personal bodyguard, six hundred of his best soldiers, all armed and ready to defend him and themselves. To Balcha's surprise, Selassie answered with the utmost politeness that he would be honored to play host to such warriors. On the way to the banquet, Balcha warned his soldiers not to get drunk and to be on their guard. When they arrived at the palace, Selassie was his charming best. He deferred to Balcha, treated him as if he desperately needed his approval and cooperation. But Balcha refused to be charmed. And he warned Selassie that if he did not return to his camp by nightfall, his army had orders to attack the capital. Selassie reacted as if hurt by his mistrust. Over the meal, when it came time for the traditional singing of songs in honor of Ethiopia's leaders, he made a point of allowing only songs honoring the warlord of Sidamo. It seemed to Balcha that Selassie was scared, intimidated by this great warrior who could not be outwitted. Sensing the change, Balcha believed that he would be the one to call the shots in the days to come. At the end of the afternoon, Balcha and his soldiers began their march back to camp amidst cheers and gun salutes. Looking back to the capital over his shoulder, he planned his strategy, how his own soldiers would march through the capital in triumph within weeks, and Selassie would be put in his place, his place being either prison or death. When Balcha came in sight of his camp, however, he saw that something was terribly wrong. Where before there had been colorful tents stretching as far as the eye could see, now there was nothing, only smoke from doused fires. What devil's magic was this? A witness told Balcha what had happened. During the banquet, a large army, commanded by an ally of Selassie's, had stolen up on Balcha's encampment by a side route he had not seen. This army had not come to fight, however, knowing that Balcha would have heard a noisy battle and hurried back with his 600-man bodyguard, Selassie had armed his own troops with baskets of gold and cash. They had surrounded Balcha's army and proceeded to purchase every last one of their weapons. Those who refused were easily intimidated. Within a few hours, Balcha's entire force had been disarmed and scattered in all directions. Realizing his danger, Balcha decided to march south with his 600 soldiers to regroup, but the same army that had disarmed his soldiers blocked his way. The other way out was to march on the capital, but Selassie had set a large army to defend it. Like a chess player, he had predicted Balcha's moves, and had checkmated him. For the first time in his life, Balcha surrendered. To repent his sins of pride and ambition, he agreed to enter a monastery. Interpretation throughout Selassie's long reign, no one could quite figure him out. Ethiopians like their leaders fierce, but Selassie, who wore the front of a gentle, peace-loving man, lasted longer than any of them. Never angry or Impatient, he lured his victims with sweet smiles, lulling them with charm and obsequiousness before he attacked. In the case of Balcha, Selassie played on the man's wariness, his suspicion that the banquet was a trap, which in fact it was, but not the one he expected. Selassie's way of allaying Balcha's fears, letting him bring his bodyguard to the banquet, giving him top billing there, making him feel in control, created a thick smoke screen, concealing the real action three miles away. Remember, 
the paranoid and wary are often the easiest to deceive. Win their trust in one area and you have a smoke screen that blinds their view in another, letting you creep up and level them with a devastating blow. A helpful or apparently honest gesture, or one that implies the other person's superiority, these are perfect diversionary devices. Properly set up, the smoke screen is a weapon of great power. It enabled the gentle celacy to totally destroy his enemy, without firing a single bullet. Do not underestimate the power of Tafari. He creeps like a mouse but he has jaws like a lion. Balcha of Sidamo's last words before entering the monastery. Keys to power if you believe that deceivers are colorful folk who mislead with elaborate lies and tall tales, you are greatly mistaken. The best deceivers utilize a bland and inconspicuous front that calls no attention to themselves. They know that extravagant words and gestures immediately raise suspicion. Instead, they envelop their mark in the familiar, the banal, the harmless. In Yellow Kid Wiles' dealings with Sam Giesel, the familiar was a business deal. In the Ethiopian case, it was Celesi's misleading obsequiousness, exactly what Balcha would have expected from a weaker warlord. Once you have lulled your sucker's attention with the familiar, they will not notice the deception being perpetrated behind their backs. This derives from a simple truth, people can only focus on one thing at a time. It is really too difficult for them to imagine that the bland and harmless person they are dealing with is simultaneously setting up something else. The grayer and more uniform the smoke in your smoke screen, the better it conceals your intentions. In the decoy and red herring devices discussed in part 1, you actively distract people, in the smoke screen, you lull your victims, drawing them into your web. Because it is so hypnotic, this is often the best way of concealing your intentions. The simplest form of smoke screen is facial expression. Behind a bland, unreadable exterior, all sorts of mayhem can be planned, without detection. This is a weapon that the most powerful men in history have learned to perfect. It was said that no one could read Franklin D. Roosevelt's face. Baron James Rothschild made a lifelong practice of disguising his real thoughts behind bland smiles and nondescript looks. Stendhal wrote of Talleyrand, never was a face less of a barometer. Henry Kissinger would bore his opponents around the negotiating table to tears with his monotonous voice, his blank look, his endless recitations of details, then, as their eyes glazed over, he would suddenly hit them with a list of bold terms. Caught off guard, they would be easily intimidated. As one poker manual explains it, while playing his hand, the good player is seldom an actor. Instead he practices a bland behavior that minimizes readable patterns, frustrates and confuses opponents, permits greater concentration. An adaptable concept, the smoke screen can be practiced on a number of levels, all playing on the psychological principles of distraction and misdirection. One of the most effective smoke screens is the noble gesture. People want to believe apparently noble gestures are genuine, for the belief is pleasant. They rarely notice how deceptive these gestures can be. The art dealer Joseph Devine was once confronted with a terrible problem. The millionaires who had paid so dearly for Devine's paintings were running out of wall space, and with inheritance taxes getting ever higher, it seemed unlikely that they would keep buying. The solution was the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., which Devine helped create in 1937 by getting Andrew Mellon to donate his collection to it. The National Gallery was the perfect front for Devine. In one gesture, his clients avoided taxes, cleared wall space for new purchases, and reduced the number of paintings on the market, maintaining the upward pressure on their prices. All this while the donors created the appearance of being public benefactors. Another effective smoke screen is the pattern, the establishment of a series of actions that seduce the victim into believing you will continue in the same way. The pattern plays on the psychology of anticipation, our behavior conforms to patterns, or so we like to think. 
In 1878 the American robber Baron J. Gould created a company that began to threaten the monopoly of the telegraph company Western Union. The directors of Western Union decided to buy Gould's company up, they had to spend a hefty sum, but they figured they had managed to rid themselves of an irritating competitor. A few months later, though, Gould was at it again, complaining he had been treated unfairly. He started up a second company to compete with Western Union and its new acquisition. The same thing happened again, Western Union bought him out to shut him. Up. Soon the pattern began for the third time, but now Gould went for the jugular, he suddenly staged a bloody takeover struggle and managed to gain complete control of Western Union. He had established a pattern that had tricked the company's directors into thinking his goal was to be bought out at a handsome rate. Once they paid him off, they relaxed and failed to notice that he was actually playing for higher stakes. The pattern is powerful in that it deceives the other person into expecting the opposite of what you are really doing. Another psychological weakness on which to construct a smoke screen is the tendency to mistake appearances for reality, the feeling that if someone seems to belong to your group, their belonging must be real. This habit makes the seamless blend a very effective front. The trick is simple, you simply blend in with those around you. The better you blend, the less suspicious you become. During the Cold War of the 1950s and 60s, as is now notorious, a slew of British civil servants passed secrets to the Soviets. They went undetected for years because they were apparently decent chaps. Had gone to all the right schools, and fit the old boy network perfectly. Blending in is the perfect smoke screen for spying. The better you do it, the better you can conceal your intentions. Remember, it takes patience and humility to dull your brilliant colors, to put on the mask of the inconspicuous. Do not despair at having to wear such a bland mask, it is often your unreadability that draws people to you and makes you appear a person of power. Image, a sheep's skin. A sheep never marauds, a sheep never deceives, a sheep is magnificently dumb and docile. With a sheepskin on his back, a fox can pass right into the chicken coop. Authority, have you ever heard of a skillful general, who intends to surprise a citadel, announcing his plan to his enemy? Conceal your purpose and hide your progress, do not disclose the extent of your designs until they cannot be opposed, until the combat is over. Win the victory before you declare the war. In a word, imitate those warlike people whose designs are not known except by the ravaged country through which they have passed. Ninon de Lanclo, 1623-1706 Reversal no smoke screen, red herring, false sincerity, or any other diversionary device will succeed in concealing your intentions if you already have an established reputation for deception. And as you get older and achieve success, it often becomes increasingly difficult to disguise your cunning. Everyone knows you practice deception, persist in playing naive and you run the risk of seeming the rankest hypocrite, which will severely limit your room to maneuver. In such cases it is better to own up, to appear the honest rogue, or, better, the repentant rogue. Not only will you be admired for your frankness, but, most wonderful and strange of all, you will be able to continue your stratagems. As P. T. Barnum, the 19th century king of humbuggery, grew older, he learned to embrace his reputation as a grand deceiver. At one point he organized a buffalo hunt in New Jersey, complete with Indians and a few imported buffalo. He publicized the hunt as genuine, but it came off as so completely fake that the crowd, instead of getting angry and asking for their money back, was greatly amused. They knew Barnum pulled tricks all the time, that was the secret of his success, and they loved him for it. Learning a lesson from this affair, Barnum stopped concealing all of his devices, even revealing his deceptions in a tell-all autobiography. As Kierkegaard wrote, the world wants to be deceived. Finally, although it is wiser to divert attention from your purposes by presenting a bland, familiar exterior, there are times when the colorful, conspicuous gesture is the right diversionary tactic. 
The great charlatan mountebanks of 17th and 18th century Europe used humor and entertainment to deceive their audiences. Dazzled by a great show, the public would not notice the charlatan's real intentions. Thus the star charlatan himself would appear in town in a night black coach drawn by black horses. Clowns, tightrope walkers, and star entertainers would accompany him, pulling people into his demonstrations of elixirs and quack potions. The charlatan made entertainment seem like the business of the day, the business of the day was actually the sale of the elixirs and quack potions. Spectacle and entertainment, clearly, are excellent devices to conceal your intentions, but they cannot be used indefinitely. The public grows tired and suspicious, and eventually catches on to the trick. And indeed the charlatans had to move quickly from town to town, before word spread that the potions were useless and the entertainment a trick. Powerful people with bland exteriors, on the other hand, the Talirans, the Rothschilds, the Celesies, can practice their deceptions in the same place throughout their lifetimes. Their act never wears thin, and rarely causes suspicion. The colorful smoke screen should be used cautiously, then, and only when the occasion is right. Law 4. Always say less than necessary. Judgment when you are trying to impress people with words, the more you say, the more common you appear, and the less in control. Even if you are saying something banal, it will seem original if you make it vague, open-ended, and sphinx-like. Powerful people impress and intimidate by saying less. The more you say, the more likely you are to say something foolish. Transgression of the law Nias Martius, also known as Coriolanus, was a great military hero of ancient Rome. In the first half of the 5th century BC he won many important battles, saving the city from calamity time and time again. Because he spent most of his time on the battlefield, few Romans knew him personally, making him something of a legendary figure. Down on his luck, the screenwriter, Michael Arlen went to New York in 1944. To drown his sorrows he paid a visit to the famous restaurant 21. In the lobby, he ran into Sam Goldwyn, who offered the somewhat impractical advice that he should buy racehorses. At the bar Arlen met Louis B. Mayer, an old acquaintance, who asked him what were his plans for the future. I was just talking to Sam Goldwyn. Began Arlen. How much did he offer you, interrupted Mayer. Not enough, he replied evasively. Would you take 15,000 for 30 weeks? Asked Mayer. No hesitation this time. Yes, said Arlen. The Little, Brown Book of Anecdotes, Clifton Fadiman, ed., 1985. In 454 BC, Coriolanus decided it was time to exploit his reputation and enter politics. He stood for election to the high rank of consul. Candidates for this position traditionally made a public address early in the race, and when Coriolanus came before the people, he began by displaying the dozens of scars he had accumulated over 17 years of fighting for Rome. Few in the crowd really heard the lengthy speech that followed, those scars, proof of his valor and patriotism, moved the people to tears. Coriolanus's election seemed certain. When the polling day arrived, however, Coriolanus made an entry into the forum escorted by the entire senate and by the city's patricians, the aristocracy. The common people who saw this were disturbed by such a blustering show of confidence on election day. And then Coriolanus spoke again, mostly addressing the wealthy citizens who had accompanied him. His words were arrogant and insolent. Claiming certain victory in the vote, he boasted of his battlefield exploits. Made sour jokes that appealed only to the patricians, voiced angry accusations against his opponents, and speculated on the riches he would bring to Rome. This time the people listened, they had not realized that this legendary soldier was also a common braggart. News of Coriolanus's second speech spread quickly through Rome, and the people turned out in great numbers to make sure he was not elected. Defeated, Coriolanus returned to the battlefield, bitter and vowing revenge on the common folk who had voted against him. Some weeks later a large shipment of grain arrived in Rome. 
The Senate was ready to distribute this food to the people, for free, but just as they were preparing to vote on the question Coriolanus appeared on the scene and took the Senate floor. The distribution, he argued, would have a harmful effect on the city as a whole. Several senators appeared one over, and the vote on the distribution fell into doubt. Coriolanus did not stop there, he went on to condemn the concept of democracy itself. He advocated getting rid of the people's representatives, the tribunes, and turning over the governing of the city to the patricians. One oft-told tale about Kissinger, involved a report that Winston Lord had worked on for days. After giving it to Kissinger, he got it back with the notation, is this the best you can do? Lord rewrote and polished and finally resubmitted it, back it came with the same curt question. After redrafting it one more time, and once again getting the same question from Kissinger, Lord snapped, damn it, yes, it's the best I can do. To which Kissinger replied, fine, then I guess I'll read it this time. Kissinger, Walter Isaacson, 1992 When word of Coriolanus's latest speech reached the people, their anger knew no bounds. The tribunes were sent to the Senate to demand that Coriolanus appear before them. He refused. Riots broke out all over the city. The Senate, fearing the people's wrath, finally voted in favor of the grain distribution. The tribunes were appeased, but the people still demanded that Coriolanus speak to them and apologize. If he repented, and agreed to keep his opinions to himself, he would be allowed to return to the battlefield. Coriolanus did appear one last time before the people, who listened to him in rapt silence. He started slowly and softly, but as the speech went on, he became more and more blunt. Yet again he hurled insults. His tone was arrogant, his expression disdainful. The more he spoke, the angrier the people became. Finally they shouted him down and silenced him. The tribunes conferred, condemned Coriolanus to death, and ordered the magistrates to take him at once to the top of the Tarpeian rock and throw him over. The delighted crowd seconded the decision. The patricians, however, managed to intervene, and the sentence was commuted to a lifelong banishment. When the people found out that Rome's great military hero would never return to the city, they celebrated in the streets. In fact no one had ever seen such a celebration, not even after the defeat of a foreign enemy. Interpretation before his entrance into politics, the name of Coriolanus evoked all. The king, Louis XIV, maintains the most impenetrable secrecy about affairs of state. The ministers attend council meetings, but he confides his plans to them only when he has reflected at length upon them and has come to a definite decision. I wish you might see the king. His expression is inscrutable, his eyes like those of a fox. He never discusses state affairs except with his ministers in council. When he speaks to courtiers he refers only to their respective prerogatives or duties. Even the most frivolous of his utterances has the air of being the pronouncement of an oracle. Primi Visconti, quoted in Louis XIV, Louis Bertrand, 1928. His battlefield accomplishments showed him as a man of great bravery. Since the citizens knew little about him, all kinds of legends became attached to his name. The moment he appeared before the Roman citizens, however, and spoke his mind, all that grandeur and mystery vanished. He bragged and blustered like a common soldier. He insulted and slandered people, as if he felt threatened and insecure. Suddenly he was not at all what the people had imagined. The discrepancy between the legend and the reality proved immensely disappointing to those who wanted to believe in their hero. The more Coriolanus said, the less powerful he appeared, a person who cannot control his words shows that he cannot control himself, and is unworthy of respect. Had Coriolanus said less, the people would never have had cause to be offended by him, would never have known his true feelings. He would have maintained his powerful aura, would certainly have been elected consul, and would have been able to accomplish his anti-democratic goals. But the human tongue is a beast that few can master. It strains constantly to break out of its cage, and if it is not tamed, 
it will run wild and cause you grief. Power cannot accrue to those who squander their treasure of words. Oysters open completely when the moon is full, and when the crab sees one it throws a piece of stone or seaweed into it and the oyster cannot close again so that it serves the crab for meat. Such is the fate of him who opens his mouth too much and thereby puts himself at the mercy of the listener. Leonardo da Vinci, 1452-1519 Observance of the law in the court of Louis XIV, nobles and ministers would spend days and nights debating issues of state. They would confer, argue, make and break alliances, and argue again, until finally the critical moment arrived, two of them would be chosen to represent the different sides to Louis himself, who would decide what should be done. After these persons were chosen, everyone would argue some more, how should the issues be phrased? What would appeal to Louis, what would annoy him? At what time of day should the representatives approach him, and in what part of the Versailles Palace? What expression should they have on their faces? Undutiful words of a subject do often take deeper root than the memory of ill deeds. The late Earl of Essex told Queen Elizabeth that her conditions were as crooked as her carcass, but it cost him his head, which his insurrection had not cost him but for that speech. Sir Walter Raleigh, 1554-1618 Finally, after all this was settled, the fateful moment would finally arrive. The two men would approach Lewis, always a delicate matter, and when they finally had his ear, they would talk about the issue at hand, spelling out the options in detail. Lewis would listen in silence, a most enigmatic look on his face. Finally, when each had finished his presentation and had asked for the king's opinion, he would look at them both and say, I shall see. Then he would walk away. The ministers and courtiers would never hear another word on this subject from the king, they would simply see the result, weeks later, when he would come to a decision and act. He would never bother to consult them on the matter again. Interpretation Louis XIV was a man of very few words. His most famous remark is, Letat, c'est moi, I am the state, nothing could be more pithy yet more eloquent. His infamous, I shall see, was one of several extremely short phrases that he would apply to all manner of requests. Lewis was not always this way, as a young man he was known for talking at length, delighting in his own eloquence. His later taciturnity was self-imposed, an act, a mask he used to keep everybody below him off balance. No one knew exactly where he stood, or could predict his reactions. No one could try to deceive him by saying what they thought he wanted to hear, because no one knew what he wanted to hear. As they talked on and on to the silent Lewis, they revealed more and more about themselves, information he would later use against them to great effect. In the end, Lewis's silence kept those around him terrified and under his thumb. It was one of the foundations of his power. As Saint Simon wrote, No one knew as well as he how to sell his words, his smile, even his glances. Everything in him was valuable because he created differences, and his majesty was enhanced by the sparseness of his words. It is even more damaging for a minister to say foolish things than to do them. Cardinal de Retz, 1613-1679 Key's two-power power is in many ways a game of appearances, and when you say less than necessary, you inevitably appear greater and more powerful than you are. Your silence will make other people uncomfortable. Humans are machines. Of interpretation and explanation, they have to know what you are thinking. When you carefully control what you reveal, they cannot pierce your intentions or your meaning. Your short answers and silences will put them on the defensive, and they will jump in, nervously filling the silence with all kinds of comments that will reveal valuable information about them and their weaknesses. They will leave a meeting with you feeling as if they had been robbed, and they will go home and ponder your every word. This extra attention to your brief comments will only add to your power. Saying less than necessary is not for kings and statesmen only. In most areas of life, the less you say, the more profound and mysterious you appear. As a young man, the artist Andy Warhol had the revelation that it was generally impossible to get people to do what you wanted them to do by talking to them. 
they would turn against you, subvert your wishes. Disobey you out of sheer perversity. He once told a friend, I learned that. You actually have more power when you shut up. In his later life Warhol employed this strategy with great success. His interviews were exercises in oracular speech, he would say something vague and ambiguous, and the interviewer would twist in circles trying to figure it out, imagining there was something profound behind his often meaningless phrases. Warhol rarely talked about his work, he let others do the interpreting. He claimed to have learned this technique from that master of enigma Marcel Duchamp, another 20th century artist who realized early on that the less he said about his work, the more people talked about it. And the more they talked, the more valuable his work became. By saying less than necessary you create the appearance of meaning and power. Also, the less you say, the less risk you run of saying something foolish, even dangerous. In 1825 a new Tsar, Nicholas I, ascended the throne of Russia. A rebellion immediately broke out, led by liberals. Demanding that the country modernize, that its industries and civil structures catch up with the rest of Europe. Brutally crushing this rebellion, the Decemberist uprising, Nicholas I sentenced one of its leaders, Kondraty Ryleyev, to death. On the day of the execution Ryleyev stood on the gallows, the noose around his neck. The trap door opened, but as Ryleyev dangled, the rope broke, dashing him to the ground. At the time, events like this were considered signs of providence or heavenly will, and a man saved from execution this way was usually pardoned. As Ryleyev got to his feet, bruised and dirted but believing his neck had been saved, he called out to the crowd, you see, in Russia they don't know how to do anything properly, not even how to make rope. A messenger immediately went to the Winter Palace with news of the failed hanging. Vexed by this disappointing turnabout, Nicholas I nevertheless began to sign the pardon. But then, did Ryleyev say anything after this miracle, the Tsar asked the messenger. Sire, the messenger replied, he said that in Russia they don't even know how to make rope. In that case, said the Tsar, let us prove the contrary, and he tore up the pardon. The next day Ryleyev was hanged again. This time the rope did. Not break. Learn the lesson, once the words are out, you cannot take them back. Keep them under control. Be particularly careful with sarcasm, the momentary satisfaction you gain with your biting words will be outweighed by the price you pay. Image, the oracle at Delphi. When visitors consulted the oracle, the priestess would utter a few enigmatic words that seemed full of meaning and import. No one disobeyed the words of the oracle, they held power over life and death. Authority, never start moving your own lips and teeth before the subordinates do. The longer I keep quiet, the sooner others move their lips and teeth. As they move their lips and teeth, I can thereby understand their real intentions. If the sovereign is not mysterious, the ministers will find opportunity to take and take. Han Fei Tzu, Chinese philosopher, 3rd century BC. Reversal. There are times when it is unwise to be silent. Silence can arouse suspicion and even insecurity, especially in your superiors. A vague or ambiguous comment can open you up to interpretations you had not bargained for. Silence and saying less than necessary must be practiced with caution, then, and in the right situations. It is occasionally wiser to imitate the court jester, who plays the fool but knows he is smarter than the king. He talks and talks and entertains, and no one suspects that he is more than just a fool. Also, words can sometimes act as a kind of smoke screen for any deception you might practice. By bending your listener's ear with talk, you can distract and mesmerize them, the more you talk, in fact, the less suspicious of you they become. The verbose are not perceived as sly and manipulative but as helpless and unsophisticated. This is the reverse of the silent policy employed by the powerful, by talking more, and making. Yourself appear weaker and less intelligent than your mark, you can practice. Deception with greater ease. Law. 5. 
so much depends on reputation. Guard it with your life. Judgment reputation is the cornerstone of power. Through reputation alone you can intimidate and win, once it slips, however, you are vulnerable, and will be attacked on all sides. Make your reputation unassailable. Always be alert to potential attacks and thwart them before they happen. Meanwhile, learn to destroy your enemies by opening holes in their own reputations. Then stand aside and let public opinion hang them. Observance of the Law I During China's War of the Three Kingdoms, AD 207-265, the Great General Chukou Liang, leading the forces of the Shu Kingdom, dispatched his vast army to a distant camp while he rested in a small town with a handful of soldiers. Suddenly sentinels hurried in with the alarming news that an enemy force of over 150,000 troops under Sima E was approaching. With only a hundred men to defend him, Chukou Yang's situation was hopeless. The enemy would finally capture this renowned leader. The animals stricken with the plague. A frightful epidemic sent to earth by heaven intent to vent its fury on a sinful world, to call it by its rightful name, the pestilence, that Akron filling vial of virulence had fallen on every animal. Not all were dead, but all lay near to dying, and none was any longer trying to find new fuel to feed life's flickering fires. No foods excited their desires, no more did wolves and foxes rove in search of harmless, helpless prey, and dove would not consort with dove, for love and joy had flown away. The lion assumed the chair to say, Dear friends, I doubt not it's for heaven's high ends that on us sinners woe must fall. Let him of us who sin the most fall victim to the avenging heavenly host, and may he win salvation for us all for history teaches us that in these crises we must make sacrifices. Undeceived and sternied, let's inspect our conscience. As I recollect, to put my greedy appetite to sleep, I've banquetted on many a sheep. Who'd injured me in no respect, and even in my time been known to try shepherd pie. If need be. Then, I'll die. Yet I suspect that others also ought to own their sins. It's only fair that all should do their best to single out the guiltiest. Sire, you're too good a king, the fox begins, such scruples are too delicate. My word, to each sheep, that profane and vulgar herd, that sin. Nay, sire, enough for such a crew to be devoured by such as you, while of the shepherds we may say that they deserve the worst they got, there's being the lot that over us beasts plot a flimsy dream begotten sway. Thus spake the fox, and toady cheers rose high, while none dared cast too cold an eye on tigers, bears, and other eminences most unpardonable offenses. Each, of never mind what courish breed, was really a saint, they all agreed. Then came the ass, to say, I do recall how once I crossed an abbey mead where hunger, grass in plenty, and withal, I have no doubt, some imp of greed, assailed me, and I shaved a tongue's breadth wide where frankly. I'd no right to any grass. All forthwith fell full cry upon the ass, a wolf of some book learning. Testified that that cursed beast must suffer their despite, that gall-skinned author of their piteous plight. They judged him fit for naught but gallows bait, how vile, another's grass to sequestrate. His death alone could expiate a crime so heinous, as full well he learns. The court, as you're of great or poor estate, will paint you either white or black by turns. The Best Fables of L.A. Fontaine, Jean de L.A. Fontaine, 1621-1695 Without lamenting his fate, or wasting time trying to figure out how he had been caught, Liang ordered his troops to take down their flags, throw open the city gates, and hide. He himself then took a seat on the most visible part of the city's wall, wearing a Taoist robe. He lit some incense, strummed his lute, and began to chant. Minutes later he could see the vast enemy army approaching, an endless phalanx of soldiers. Pretending not to notice them, he continued to sing and play the lute. 
Soon the army stood at the town gates. At its head was Sima E, who instantly recognized the man on the wall. Even so, as his soldiers itched to enter the unguarded town through its open gates, Sima E hesitated, held them back, and studied Leon on the wall. Then, he ordered an immediate and speedy retreat. Interpretation Chuko Liang was commonly known as the Sleeping Dragon. His exploits in the War of the Three Kingdoms were legendary. Once a man claiming to be a disaffected enemy lieutenant came to his camp, offering help and information. Liang instantly recognized the situation as a setup, this man was a false deserter, and should be beheaded. At the last minute, though, as the axe was about to fall, Liang stopped the execution and offered to spare the man's life if he agreed to become a double agent. Grateful and terrified, the man agreed, and began supplying false information to the enemy. Liang won battle after battle. On another occasion Liang stole a military seal and created false documents dispatching his enemy's troops to distant locations. Once the troops had dispersed, he was able to capture three cities, so that he controlled an entire corridor of the enemy's kingdom. He also once tricked the enemy into believing one of its best generals was a traitor, forcing the man to escape and join forces with Liang. The sleeping dragon carefully cultivated his reputation of being the cleverest man in China, one who always had a trick up his sleeve. As powerful as any weapon, this reputation struck fear into his enemy. Sima Yi had fought against Chuko Liang dozens of times and knew him well. When he came on the empty city, with Liang praying on the wall, he was stunned. The Taoist robes, the chanting, the incense, this had to be a game of intimidation. The man was obviously taunting him, daring him to walk into a trap. The game was so obvious that for one moment it crossed Yi's mind that Liang actually was alone, and desperate. But so great was his fear of Liang that he dared not risk finding out. Such is the power of reputation. It can put a vast army on the defensive, even force them into retreat, without a single arrow being fired. For, as Cicero says, even those who argue against fame still want the books they write against it to bear their name in the title and hope to become famous for despising it. Everything else is subject to barter, we will let our friends have our goods and our lives if need be, but a case of sharing our fame and making someone else the gift of our reputation is hardly to be found. Montaigne, 1533-1592 Observance of the Law II In 1841 the young P. T. Barnum, trying to establish his reputation as America's premier showman, decided to purchase the American Museum in Manhattan and turn it into a collection of curiosities that would secure his fame. The problem was that he had no money. The museum's asking price was $15,000, but Barnum was able to put together a proposal that appealed to the institution's owners even though it replaced cash up front with dozens of guarantees and references. The owners came to a verbal agreement with Barnum, but at the last minute, the principal partner changed his mind, and the museum and its collection were sold to the directors of Peel's museum. Barnum was infuriated, but the partner explained that business was business, the museum had been sold to Peel's because Peel's had a reputation and Barnum had none. Barnum immediately decided that if he had no reputation to bank on, his only recourse was to ruin the reputation of Peel's. Accordingly he launched a letter-writing campaign in the newspapers, calling the owners a bunch of broken-down bank directors who had no idea how to run a museum or entertain people. He warned the public against buying Peel's stock, since the business's purchase of another museum would invariably spread its resources thin. The campaign was effective, the stock plummeted, and with no more confidence in Peel's track record and reputation, the owners of the American Museum reneged on their deal and sold the whole thing to Barnum. It took years for Peel's to recover, and they never forgot what Barnum had done. Mr. Peel himself decided to attack Barnum by building a reputation for highbrow entertainment, promoting his museum's programs as more scientific than those of his vulgar competitor. Mesmerism, hypnotism, was one of Peel's scientific attractions, and for a while it drew big crowds and was quite successful. 
To fight back, Barnum decided to attack Peel's reputation yet again. Barnum organized a rival mesmeric performance in which he himself apparently put a little girl into a trance. Once she seemed to have fallen. Deeply under, he tried to hypnotize members of the audience, but no matter. How hard he tried, none of the spectators fell under his spell, and many of them began to laugh. A frustrated Barnum finally announced that to prove the little girl's trance was real, he would cut off one of her fingers without her noticing. But as he sharpened the knife, the little girl's eyes popped open and she ran away, to the audience's delight. He repeated this and other parodies for several weeks. Soon no one could take Peel's show seriously, and attendance went way down. Within a few weeks, the show closed. Over the next few years Barnum established a reputation for audacity and consummate showmanship that lasted his whole life. Peel's reputation, on the other hand, never recovered. Interpretation Barnum used two different tactics to ruin Peel's reputation. The first was simple, he sowed doubts about the museum's stability and solvency. Doubt is a powerful weapon, once you let it out of the bag with insidious rumors, your opponents are in a horrible dilemma. On the one hand they can deny the rumors, even prove that you have slandered them. But a layer of suspicion will remain, why are they defending themselves so desperately? Maybe the rumor has some truth to it. If, on the other hand, they take the high road and ignore you, the doubts, unrefuted, will be even stronger. If done correctly, the sowing of rumors can so infuriate and unsettle your rivals that in defending themselves they will make numerous mistakes. This is the perfect weapon for those who have no reputation of their own to work from. Once Barnum did have a reputation of his own, he used the second, gentler tactic, the fake hypnotism demonstration, he ridiculed his rival's reputation. This too was extremely successful. Once you have a solid base of respect, ridiculing your opponent both puts him on the defensive and draws more attention to you, enhancing your own reputation. Outright slander and insult are too strong at this point, they are ugly, and may hurt you more than help you. But gentle barbs and mockery suggest that you have a strong enough sense of your own worth to enjoy a good laugh at. Your rival's expense. A humorous front can make you out as a harmless entertainer while poking holes in the reputation of your rival. It is easier to cope with a bad conscience than with a bad reputation. Friedrich Nietzsche, 1844 to 1900. Keys to power the people around us, even our closest friends, will always to some extent remain mysterious and unfathomable. Their characters have secret recesses that they never reveal. The unknowableness of other people could prove disturbing if we thought about it long enough, since it would make it impossible for us really to judge other people. So we prefer to ignore this fact, and to judge people on their appearances, on what is most visible to our eyes, clothes, gestures, words, actions. In the social realm, appearances are the barometer of almost all of our judgments, and you must never be misled into believing otherwise. One false slip, one awkward or sudden change in your appearance, can prove disastrous. This is the reason for the supreme importance of making and maintaining a reputation that is of your own creation. That reputation will protect you in the dangerous game of appearances, distracting the probing eyes of others from knowing what you are really like, and giving you a degree of control over how the world judges you, a powerful position to be in. Reputation has a power like magic, with one stroke of its wand, it can double your strength. It can also send people scurrying away from you. Whether the exact same deeds appear brilliant or dreadful can depend entirely on the reputation of the doer. In the ancient Chinese court of the Wei Kingdom there was a man named Mitsu Xia who had a reputation for supreme civility and graciousness. He became the ruler's favorite. It was a law in Wei that whoever rides secretly in the ruler's coach shall have his feet cut off, but when Mitsu Xia's mother fell ill, he used the royal coach to visit her, pretending that the ruler had given him permission. When the ruler found out, he said, how dutiful is Mitsu Xia. For his mother's sake he even 
forgot that he was committing a crime making him liable to lose his feet. Another time the two of them took a stroll in an orchard. Mitsusia began eating a peach that he could not finish, and he gave the ruler the other half to eat. The ruler remarked, you love me so much that you would even forget your own saliva taste and let me eat the rest of the peach. Later, however, envious fellow courtiers, spreading word that Mitsusha was actually devious and arrogant, succeeded in damaging his reputation, the ruler came to see his actions in a new light. This fellow once rode in my coach under pretense of my order, he told the courtiers angrily, and another time he gave me a half-eaten peach. For the same actions that had charmed the ruler when he was the favorite, Mitsusia now had to suffer the penalties. The fate of his feet depended solely on the strength of his reputation. In the beginning, you must work to establish a reputation for one. Outstanding quality, whether generosity, or honesty, or cunning. This quality sets you apart and gets other people to talk about you. You then make your reputation known to as many people as possible, subtly, though, take care to build slowly, and with a firm foundation, and watch as it spreads like wildfire. A solid reputation increases your presence and exaggerates your strengths without your having to spend much energy. It can also create an aura around you that will instill respect, even fear. In the fighting in the North African desert during World War II, the German general Erwin Rommel had a reputation for cunning and for deceptive maneuvering that struck terror into everyone who faced him. Even when his forces were depleted, and when British tanks outnumbered his by five to one, entire cities would be evacuated at the news of his approach. As they say, your reputation inevitably precedes you, and if it inspires respect, a lot of your work is done for you before you arrive on the scene, or utter a single word. Your success seems destined by your past triumphs. Much of the success of Henry Kissinger's shuttle diplomacy rested on his reputation for ironing out differences, no one wanted to be seen as so unreasonable that Kissinger could not sway him. A peace treaty seemed a fait accompli as soon as Kissinger's name became involved in the negotiations. Make your reputation simple and base it on one sterling quality. This single quality, efficiency, say, or seductiveness, becomes a kind of calling card that announces your presence and places others under a spell. A reputation for honesty will allow you to practice all manner of deception. Casanova used his reputation as a great seducer to pave the way for his future conquests, Women who had heard of his powers became immensely curious, and wanted to discover for themselves what had made him so romantically successful. Perhaps you have already stained your reputation, so that you are prevented from establishing a new one. In such cases it is wise to associate with someone whose image counteracts your own, using their good name to whitewash and elevate yours. It is hard, for example, to erase a reputation for dishonesty by yourself, but a paragon of honesty can help. When P. T. Barnum wanted to clean up a reputation for promoting vulgar entertainment, he brought the singer Jenny Lind over from Europe. She had a stellar, high-class reputation, and the American tour Barnum sponsored for her greatly enhanced his own image. Similarly the great robber barons of 19th century America were long unable to rid themselves of a reputation for cruelty and mean-spiritedness. Only when they began collecting art, so that the names of Morgan and Frick became permanently associated with those of da Vinci and Rembrandt, were they able to soften their unpleasant image. Reputation is a treasure to be carefully collected and hoarded. Especially when you are first establishing it, you must protect it strictly, anticipating all attacks on it. Once it is solid, do not let yourself get angry or defensive at the slanderous comments of your enemies, that reveals insecurity, not confidence in your reputation. Take the high road instead, and never appear desperate in your self-defense. On the other hand, an attack on another man's reputation is a potent weapon, particularly when you have less power than he does. He has much more to lose in such a battle, and your own thus far small reputation gives him a small target. When he tries to return your fire. Barnum used such campaigns to great effect in his early career. 
but this tactic must be practiced with skill, you must not seem to engage in petty vengeance. If you do not break your enemy's reputation cleverly, you will inadvertently ruin your own. Thomas Edison, considered the inventor who harnessed electricity, believed that a workable system would have to be based on direct current, DC. When the Serbian scientist Nikola Tesla appeared to have succeeded in creating a system based on alternating current, AC, Edison was furious. He determined to ruin Tesla's reputation, by making the public believe that the AC system was inherently unsafe, and Tesla irresponsible in promoting it. To this end he captured all kinds of household pets and electrocuted them to death with an AC current. When this wasn't enough, in 1890 he got New York State prison authorities to organize the world's first execution by electrocution, using an AC current. But Edison's electrocution experiments had all been with small creatures, the charge was too weak, and the man was only half killed. In perhaps the country's cruelest state-authorized execution, the procedure had to be repeated. It was an awful spectacle. Although, in the long run, it is Edison's name that has survived, at the time his campaign damaged his own reputation more than Tesla's. He backed off. The lesson is simple, never go too far in attacks like these, for that will draw more attention to your own vengefulness than to the person you are slandering. When your own reputation is solid, use subtler tactics, such as satire and ridicule, to weaken your opponent while making you out as a charming rogue. The mighty lion toys with the mouse that crosses his path, any other reaction would mar his fearsome reputation. Image, a mind full of diamonds and rubies. You dug for it, you found it, and your wealth is now assured. Guard it with your life. Robbers and thieves will appear from all sides. Never take your wealth for granted, and constantly renew it, time will diminish the jewel's luster, and bury them from sight. Authority, therefore I should wish our courtier to bolster up his inherent worth with skill and cunning, and ensure that whenever he has to go where he is a stranger, he is preceded by a good reputation. For the fame which appears to rest on the opinions of many fosters a certain unshakable belief in a man's worth which is then easily strengthened in minds already thus disposed and prepared. Baldassare Castiglione, 1478-1529 Reversal There is no possible reversal. Reputation is critical, there are no exceptions to this law. Perhaps, not caring what others think of you, you gain a reputation for insolence and arrogance, but that can be a valuable image in itself, Oscar Wilde used it to great advantage. Since we must live in society and must depend on the opinions of others, there is nothing to be gained by neglecting your reputation. By not caring how you are perceived, you let others decide this for you. Be the master of your fate, and also of your reputation. Law 6 Court attention at all cost Judgment everything is judged by its appearance, what is unseen counts for nothing. Never let yourself get lost in the crowd, then, or buried in oblivion. Stand out. Be conspicuous, at all cost. Make yourself a magnet of attention by appearing larger, more colorful, more mysterious than the bland and timid masses. Part 1, Surround Your Name with the Sensational and Scandalous Draw attention to yourself by creating an unforgettable, even controversial image. Court scandal. Do anything to make yourself seem larger than life and shine more brightly than those around you. Make no distinction between kinds of attention, notoriety of any sort will bring you power. Better to be slandered and attacked than ignored. Observance of the Law P. T. Barnum, America's premier 19th century showman, started his career as an assistant to the owner of a circus, Aaron Turner. In 1836 the circus stopped in Annapolis, Maryland, for a series of performances. On the morning of opening day, Barnum took a stroll through town, wearing a new black suit. People started to follow him. Someone in the gathering crowd shouted out that he was the Reverend Ephraim K. Avery, infamous as a man acquitted of the charge of murder but still believed guilty by most Americans. The angry mob tore off Barnum's suit and was ready to lynch him. After desperate appeals, 
Barnum finally convinced them to follow him to the circus, where he could verify his identity. The wasp and the prince a wasp named Pintail was long in quest of some deed that would make him forever famous. So one day he entered the king's palace and stung the little prince, who was in bed. The prince awoke with loud cries. The king and his courtiers rushed in to see what had happened. The prince was yelling as the wasp stung him again and again. The courtiers tried to catch the wasp, and each in turn was stung. The whole royal household rushed in, the news soon spread, and people flocked to the palace. The city was in an uproar, all business suspended. Said the wasp to itself, before it expired from its efforts, a name without fame is like fire without flame. There is nothing like attracting notice at any cost. Indian Fable Once there, Old Turner confirmed that this was all a practical joke, he himself had spread the rumor that Barnum was Avery. The crowd dispersed, but Barnum, who had nearly been killed, was not amused. He wanted to know what could have induced his boss to play such a trick. My dear mister. Barnum, Turner replied, it was all for our good. Remember, all we need to ensure success is notoriety. And indeed everyone in town was talking about the joke, and the circus was packed that night and every night it stayed in Annapolis. Barnum had learned a lesson he would never forget. Barnum's first big venture of his own was the American Museum, a collection of curiosities, located in New York. One day a beggar approached Barnum in the street. Instead of giving him money, Barnum decided to employ him. Taking him back to the museum, he gave the man five bricks and told him to make a slow circuit of several blocks. At certain points he was to lay down a brick on the sidewalk, always keeping one brick in hand. On the return journey he was to replace each brick on the street with the one he held. Meanwhile he was to remain serious of countenance and to answer. No questions. Once back at the museum, he was to enter, walk around. Inside, then leave through the back door and make the same bricklaying circuit again. On the man's first walk through the streets, several hundred people watched his mysterious movements. By his fourth circuit, onlookers swarmed around him, debating what he was doing. Every time he entered the museum he was followed by people who bought tickets to keep watching him. Many of them were distracted by the museum's collections, and stayed inside. By the end of the first day, the brick man had drawn over a thousand people into the museum. A few days later the police ordered him to cease and desist from his walks, the crowds were blocking traffic. The bricklaying stopped but thousands of New Yorkers had entered the museum, and many of those had become P.T. Barnum converts. Even when I'm railed at, I get my quota of renown. Pietro Aretino, 1492-1556 Barnum would put a band of musicians on a balcony overlooking the street, beneath a huge banner proclaiming free music for the millions. What generosity, New Yorkers thought, and they flocked to hear the free concerts. But Barnum took pains to hire the worst musicians he could find. And soon after the band struck up, people would hurry to buy tickets to the museum, where they would be out of earshot of the band's noise, and of the booing of the crowd. The court artist a work that was voluntarily presented to a prince was bound to seem in some way special. The artist himself might also try to attract the attention of the court through his behavior. In Vasari's judgment Sodoma was, well known both for his personal eccentricities and for his reputation as a good painter. Because Pope Leo X found pleasure in such strange, hair-brained individuals, he made Sodoma a knight, causing the artist to go completely out of his mind. Van Mander found it odd that the products of Cornelis Kettle's experiments in mouth and foot painting were bought by notable persons, because of their oddity, yet Kettle was only adding a variation to similar experiments by Titian, Hugo de Carpi and Palma Giovanni, who, according to Boschini painted with their fingers, because they wished to imitate the method used by the Supreme Creator. Van Mander reports that Gossard attracted the attention of Emperor Charles V by wearing a fantastic paper costume. In doing so he was adopting the 
Tactics used by Dinocrates, who, in order to gain access to Alexander the Great, is said to have appeared disguised as the naked Hercules when the monarch was sitting in judgment. The Court Artist, Martin Warnke, 1993 One of the first oddities Barnum toured around the country was Joyce Haight, a woman he claimed was 161 years old, and whom he advertised as a slave who had once been George Washington's nurse. After several months the crowds began to dwindle, so Barnum sent an anonymous letter to the papers, claiming that Haight was a clever fraud. Joyce Haight, he wrote, is not a human being but an automaton, made up of whalebone, India rubber, and numberless springs. Those who had not bothered to see her before were immediately curious, and those who had already seen her paid to see her again, to find out whether the rumor that she was a robot was true. In 1842, Barnum purchased the carcass of what was purported to be a mermaid. This creature resembled a monkey with the body of a fish, but the head and body were perfectly joined, it was truly a wonder. After some research Barnum discovered that the creature had been expertly put together in Japan, where the hoax had caused quite a stir. He nevertheless planted articles in newspapers around the country. Claiming the capture of a mermaid in the Fiji Islands. He also sent the paper's woodcut prints of paintings showing mermaids. By the time he showed the specimen in his museum, a national debate had been sparked over the existence of these mythical creatures. A few months before Barnum's campaign, no one had cared for even known about mermaids, now everyone was talking about them as if they were real. Crowds flocked in record numbers to see the Fiji mermaid, and to hear debates on the subject. A few years later, Barnum toured Europe with General Tom Thumb, a five-year-old dwarf from Connecticut whom Barnum claimed was an eleven-year-old English boy, and whom he had trained to do many remarkable acts. During this tour Barnum's name attracted such attention that Queen Victoria, that paragon of sobriety, requested a private audience with him and his talented dwarf at Buckingham Palace. The English press may have ridiculed Barnum, but Victoria was royally entertained by him, and respected him ever after. Interpretation Barnum understood the fundamental truth about attracting attention, once people's eyes are on you, you have a special legitimacy. For Barnum, creating interest meant creating a crowd, as he later wrote, every crowd has a silver lining. And crowds tend to act in conjunction. If one person stops to see your beggar man laying bricks in the street, more will do the same. They will gather like dust bunnies. Then, given a gentle push, they will enter your museum or watch your show. To create a crowd you have to do something different and odd. Any kind of curiosity will serve the purpose, for crowds are magnetically attracted by the unusual and inexplicable. And once you have their attention, never let it go. If it veers toward other people, it does so at your expense. Barnum would ruthlessly suck attention from his competitors, knowing what a valuable commodity it is. At the beginning of your rise to the top, then, spend all your energy on Attracting attention Most important, the quality of the attention is irrelevant. No matter how badly his shows were reviewed, or how slanderously personal were the attacks on his hoaxes, Barnum would never complain. If a newspaper critic reviled him particularly badly, in fact, he made sure to invite the man to an opening and to give him the best seat in the house. He would even write anonymous attacks on his own work, just to keep his name in the papers. From Barnum's vantage, attention, whether negative or positive, was the main ingredient of his success. The worst fate in the world for a man who yearns fame, glory, and, of course, power is to be ignored. If the courtier happens to engage in arms in some public spectacle such as jousting, he will ensure that the horse he has is beautifully caparisoned, that he himself is suitably attired, with appropriate mottos and ingenious devices to attract the eyes of the onlookers in his direction as surely as the lodestone attracts iron. Baldassare Castiglione, 1478-1529 Keys to power burning more brightly than those around you is a skill that no one is born with. You have to learn to attract attention, as surely as the lodestone attracts iron. At the start of your career, 
you must attach your name and reputation to a quality, an image, that sets you apart from other people. This image can be something like a characteristic style of dress, or a personality quirk that amuses people and gets talked about. Once the image is established, you have an appearance, a place in the sky for your star. It is a common mistake to imagine that this peculiar appearance of yours should not be controversial, that to be attacked is somehow bad. Nothing could be further from the truth. To avoid being a flash in the pan, and having your notoriety eclipsed by another, you must not discriminate between different types of attention, in the end, every kind will work in your favor. Barnum, we have seen, welcomed personal attacks and felt no need to defend himself. He deliberately courted the image of being a humbug. The court of Louis XIV contained many talented writers, artists, great beauties, and men and women of impeccable virtue, but no one was more talked about than the singular Duc de Lausanne. The Duke was short, almost dwarfish, and he was prone to the most insolent kinds of behavior, he slept with the king's mistress, and openly insulted not only other courtiers but the king himself. Louis, however, was so beguiled by the duke's eccentricities that he could not bear his absences from the court. It was simple, the strangeness of the duke's character attracted attention. Once people were enthralled by him, they wanted him around at any cost. Society craves larger-than-life figures, people who stand above the general mediocrity. Never be afraid, then, of the qualities that set you apart and draw attention to you. Court controversy, even scandal. It is better to be attacked, even slandered, than ignored. All professions are ruled by this law, and all professionals must have a bit of the showman about them. The great scientist Thomas Edison knew that to raise money he had to remain in the public eye at any cost. Almost as important as the inventions themselves was how he presented them to the public and courted attention. Edison would design visually dazzling experiments to display his discoveries with electricity. He would talk of future inventions that seemed fantastic at the time, robots, and machines that could photograph thought and that he had no intention of wasting his energy on, but that made the public talk about him. He did everything he could to make sure that he received more attention than his great rival Nikola Tesla, who may actually have been more brilliant than he was but whose name was far less known. In 1915, it was rumored that Edison and Tesla would be joint recipients of that year's Nobel Prize in Physics. The prize was eventually given to a pair of English physicists, only later was it discovered that the prize committee had actually approached Edison, but he had turned them down, refusing to share the prize with Tesla. By that time his fame was more secure than Tesla's, and he thought it better to refuse the honor than to allow his rival the attention that would have come even from sharing the prize. If you find yourself in a lowly position that offers little opportunity for you to draw attention, an effective trick is to attack the most visible, most famous, most powerful person you can find. When Pietro Aretino, a young Roman servant boy of the early 16th century, wanted to get attention as a writer of verses, he decided to publish a series of satirical poems ridiculing the Pope and his affection for a pet elephant. The attack put Aretino in the public eye immediately. A slanderous attack on a person in a position of power would have a similar effect. Remember, however, to use such tactics sparingly after you have the public's attention, when the act can wear thin. Once in the limelight you must constantly renew it by adapting and varying your method of courting attention. If you don't, the public will grow tired, will take you for granted, and will move on to a newer star. The game requires constant vigilance and creativity. Pablo Picasso never allowed himself to fade into the background, if his name became too attached to a particular style, he would deliberately upset the public with a new series of paintings that went against all expectations. Better to create something ugly and disturbing, he believed, than to let viewers grow too familiar with his work. Understand, people feel superior to the person whose actions they can predict. If you show them who is in control by playing against their expectations, you both gain their respect and tighten your hold on their fleeting attention. Image, 
the limelight. The actor who steps into this brilliant light attains a heightened presence. All eyes are on him. There is room for only one actor at a time in the limelight's narrow beam, do whatever it takes to make yourself its focus. Make your gestures so large, amusing, and scandalous that the light stays on you while the other actors are left in the shadows. Authority, be ostentatious and be seen. What is not seen is as though it did not exist. It was light that first caused all creation to shine forth. Display fills up many blanks, covers up deficiencies, and gives everything a second life, especially when it is backed by genuine merit. Baltasar Gratian, 1601-1658 Part 2, Create an Air of Mystery In a world growing increasingly banal and familiar, what seems enigmatic instantly draws attention. Never make it too clear what you are doing or about to do. Do not show all your cards. An air of mystery heightens your presence, it also creates anticipation, everyone will be watching you to see what happens next. Use mystery to beguile, seduce, even frighten. Observance of the law beginning in 1905, rumors started to spread throughout Paris of a young oriental girl who danced in a private home, wrapped in veils that she gradually discarded. A local journalist who had seen her dancing reported that, a woman from the Far East had come to Europe laden with perfume and jewels, to introduce some of the richness of the oriental color and life into the satiated society of European cities. Soon everyone knew the dancer's name, Mata Hari. Early that year, in the winter, small and select audiences would gather in a salon filled with Indian statues and other relics while an orchestra played music inspired by Hindu and Javanese melodies. After keeping the audience waiting and wondering, Mata Hari would suddenly appear, in a startling costume, a white cotton brassiere covered with Indian-type jewels, jeweled bands at the waist supporting a sarong that revealed as much as it. Concealed, bracelets up the arms. Then Mata Hari would dance, in a style. No one in France had seen before, her whole body swaying as if she were in a trance. She told her excited and curious audience that her dances told stories from Indian mythology and Javanese folktales. Soon the cream of Paris, and ambassadors from far-off lands, were competing for invitations to the salon, where it was rumored that Mata Hari was actually performing sacred dances in the nude. The public wanted to know more about her. She told journalists that she was actually Dutch in origin, but had grown up on the island of Java. She would also talk about time spent in India, how she had learned sacred. Hindu dances there, and how Indian women can shoot straight, ride horseback, and are capable of doing logarithms and talk philosophy. By the summer of 1905, although few Parisians had actually seen Mata Hari dance, her name was on everyone's lips. As Mata Hari gave more interviews, the story of her origins kept changing, she had grown up in India, her grandmother was the daughter of a Javanese princess, she had lived on the island of Sumatra where she had spent her time horseback riding, gun in hand, and risking her life. No one knew anything certain about her, but journalists did not mind these changes in her biography. They compared her to an Indian goddess, a creature from the pages of Baudelaire, whatever their imagination wanted to see in this mysterious woman from the East. In August of 1905, Mata Hari performed for the first time in public. Crowds thronging to see her on opening night caused a riot. She had now become a cult figure, spawning many imitations. One reviewer wrote, Mata Hari personifies all the poetry of India, its mysticism, its voluptuousness, its hypnotizing charm. Another noted, if India possesses such unexpected treasures, then all Frenchmen will emigrate to the shores of the Ganges. Soon the fame of Mata Hari and her sacred Indian dances spread beyond Paris. She was invited to Berlin, Vienna, Milan. Over the next few years she performed throughout Europe, mixed with the highest social circles, and earned an income that gave her an independence rarely enjoyed by a woman of the period. Then, near the end of World War I, she was arrested in France, tried, convicted, and finally executed as a German spy.
Only during the trial did the truth come out, Mata Hari was not from Java or India, had not grown up in the Orient, did not have a drop of Eastern blood in her body. Her real name was Margaretha Zell, and she came from the stolid northern province of Friesland, Holland. Interpretation When Margaretha Zell arrived in Paris, in 1904, she had half a franc in her pocket. She was one of the thousands of beautiful young girls who flocked to Paris every year, taking work as artists, models, nightclub dancers, or vaudeville performers at the Folies Bergera. After a few years they would inevitably be replaced by younger girls, and would often end up on the streets, turning to prostitution, or else returning to the town they came from, older and chastened. Zell had higher ambitions. She had no dance experience and had never performed in the theater, but as a young girl she had traveled with her family and had witnessed local dances in Java and Sumatra. Zell clearly understood that what was important in her act was not the dance itself, or even her face or figure, but her ability to create an air of mystery about herself. The mystery she created lay not just in her dancing, or her costumes, or the stories she would tell, or her endless lies about her origins, it lay in an atmosphere enveloping everything she did. There was nothing you could say for sure about her, she was always changing, always. Surprising her audience with new costumes, new dances, new stories. This air of mystery left the public always wanting to know more, always wondering about her next move. Mata Hari was no more beautiful than many of the other young girls who came to Paris, and she was not a particularly good dancer. What separated her from the mass, what attracted and held the public's attention and made her famous and wealthy, was her mystery. People are enthralled by mystery, because it invites constant interpretation, they never tire of it. The mysterious cannot be grasped. And what cannot be seized and consumed creates power. Keys to power in the past, the world was filled with the terrifying and unknowable, diseases, disasters, capricious despots, the mystery of death itself. What we could not understand we reimagined as myths and spirits. Over the centuries, though, we have managed, through science and reason, to illuminate the darkness, what was mysterious and forbidding has grown familiar and comfortable. Yet this light has a price, in a world that is ever more banal, that has had its mystery and myth squeezed out of it, we secretly crave enigmas, people or things that cannot be instantly interpreted, seized, and consumed. That is the power of the mysterious, it invites layers of interpretation, excites our imagination, seduces us into believing that it conceals something marvelous. The world has become so familiar and its inhabitants so predictable that what wraps itself in mystery will almost always draw the limelight to it and make us watch it. Do not imagine that to create an air of mystery you have to be grand and awe-inspiring. Mystery that is woven into your day-to-day -day demeanor, and is subtle, has that much more power to fascinate and attract attention. Remember, most people are upfront, can be read like an open book, take little care to control their words or image, and are hopelessly predictable. By simply holding back, keeping silent, occasionally uttering ambiguous phrases, deliberately appearing inconsistent, and acting odd in the subtlest. Of ways, you will emanate an aura of mystery. The people around you will. Then magnify that aura by constantly trying to interpret you. Both artists and con artists understand the vital link between being mysterious and attracting interest. Count Victor Lustig, the aristocrat of swindlers, played the game to perfection. He was always doing things that were different or seemed to make no sense. He would show up at the best hotels in a limo driven by a Japanese chauffeur, no one had ever seen a Japanese chauffeur before, so this seemed exotic and strange. Lustig would dress in the most expensive clothing, but always with something, a medal, a flower, an armband, out of place, at least in conventional terms. This was seen not as tasteless but as odd and intriguing. In hotels he would be seen receiving telegrams at all hours, one after the other, brought to him by his Japanese chauffeur, telegrams he would tear up with utter nonchalance. In fact they were fakes, completely blank. He would sit alone in the dining. 
room, reading a large and impressive looking book, smiling at people yet. Remaining aloof. Within a few days, of course, the entire hotel would be abuzz with interest in this strange man. All this attention allowed Lustig to lure suckers in with ease. They would beg for his confidence and his company. Everyone wanted to be seen. With this mysterious aristocrat. And in the presence of this distracting enigma, they wouldn't even notice that they were being robbed blind. An air of mystery can make the mediocre appear intelligent and profound. It made Mata Hari, a woman of average appearance and intelligence, seem like a goddess, and her dancing divinely inspired. An air of mystery about an artist makes his or her artwork immediately more intriguing, a trick Marcel Duchamp played to great effect. It is all very easy to do, say little about your work, tease and titillate with alluring, even contradictory comments, then stand back and let others try to make sense of it all. Mysterious people put others in a kind of inferior position, that of trying to figure them out. To degrees that they can control, they also elicit the fear surrounding anything uncertain or unknown. All great leaders know that an aura of mystery draws attention to them and creates an intimidating presence. Mao Zedong, for example, cleverly cultivated an enigmatic image, he had no worries about seeming inconsistent or contradicting himself, the very contradictoriness of his actions and words meant that he always had the upper hand. No one, not even his own wife, ever felt they understood him, and he therefore seemed larger than life. This also meant that the public paid constant attention to him, ever anxious to witness his next move. If your social position prevents you from completely wrapping your actions in mystery, you must at least learn to make yourself less obvious. Every now and then, act in a way that does not mesh with other people's perception of you. This way you keep those around you on the defensive. Eliciting the kind of attention that makes you powerful. Done right, the Creation of enigma can also draw the kind of attention that strikes terror into your enemy. During the Second Punic War, 219-202 BC, the great Carthaginian general Hannibal was wreaking havoc in his march on Rome. Hannibal was known for his cleverness and duplicity. Under his leadership Carthage's army, though smaller than those of the Romans, had constantly outmaneuvered them. On one occasion, though, Hannibal's scouts made a horrible blunder, leading his troops into a marshy terrain with the sea at their back. The Roman army blocked the mountain passes that led inland, and its general, Fabius, was ecstatic, at last he had Hannibal trapped. Posting his best sentries on the passes, he worked on a plan to destroy Hannibal's forces. But in the middle of the night, the sentries looked down to see a mysterious sight, a huge procession of lights was heading up the mountain. Thousands and thousands of lights. If this was Hannibal's army, it had suddenly grown a hundredfold. The sentries argued heatedly about what this could mean, reinforcements from the sea. Troops that had been hidden in the area. Ghosts. No explanation made sense. As they watched, fires broke out all over the mountain, and a horrible noise drifted up to them from below, like the blowing of a million horns. Demons, they thought. The sentries, the bravest and most sensible in the Roman army, fled their posts in a panic. By the next day, Hannibal had escaped from the marshland. What was his trick? Had he really conjured up demons? Actually what he had done was order bundles of twigs to be fastened to the horns of the thousands of oxen that traveled with his troops as beasts of burden. The twigs were then lit, giving the impression of the torches of a vast army heading up the mountain. When the flames burned down to the oxen's skin, they stampeded in all directions, bellowing like mad and setting fires all over the mountainside. The key to this device's success was not the torches, the fires, or the noises in themselves, however, but the fact that Hannibal had created a puzzle that captivated the sentry's attention and gradually terrified them. From the mountaintop there was no way to explain this bizarre sight. If the sentries could have explained it they would have stayed at their posts. If you find yourself trapped, cornered, and on the defensive in some situation, try a simple experiment, 
do something that cannot be easily explained or interpreted. Choose a simple action, but carry it out in a way that unsettles your opponent, a way with many possible interpretations, making your intentions obscure. Don't just be unpredictable, although this Tactic 2 can be successful, see Law 17, like Hannibal, create a scene that cannot be read. There will seem to be no method to your madness, no rhyme or reason, no single explanation. If you do this right, you will inspire fear and trembling and the sentries will abandon their posts. Call it the feigned madness of Hamlet tactic, for Hamlet uses it to great effect in Shakespeare's play, frightening his stepfather Claudius through the mystery of his behavior. The mysterious makes your forces seem larger, your power more terrifying. Image, the dance of the veils, the veils envelop the dancer. What they reveal causes excitement. What they conceal heightens interest. The essence of mystery. Authority, if you do not declare yourself immediately, you arouse expectation. Mix a little mystery with everything, and the very mystery stirs up veneration. And when you explain, be not too explicit. In this manner you imitate the divine way when you cause men to wonder and watch. Baltasar Gratian, 1601-1658 Reversal in the beginning of your rise to the top, you must attract attention at all cost, but as you rise higher you must constantly adapt. Never wear the public out with the same tactic. An air of mystery works wonders for those who need to develop an aura of power and get themselves noticed, but it must seem measured and under control. Mata Hari went too far with her fabrications, although the accusation that she was a spy was false, at the time it was a reasonable presumption because all her lies made her seem suspicious and nefarious. Do not let your air of mystery be slowly transformed into a reputation for deceit. The mystery you create must seem a game, playful and unthreatening. Recognize when it goes too far, and pull back. There are times when the need for attention must be deferred, and when scandal and notoriety are the last things you want to create. The attention you attract must never offend or challenge the reputation of those above you. Not, at any rate, if they are secure. You will seem not only paltry but desperate by comparison. There is an art to knowing when to draw notice and when to withdraw. Lola Montez was one of the great practitioners of the art of attracting attention. She managed to rise from a middle-class Irish background to being the lover of Franz Liszt and then the mistress and political advisor of King Ludwig of Bavaria. In her later years, though, she lost her sense of proportion. In London in 1850 there was to be a performance of Shakespeare's Macbeth featuring the greatest actor of the time, Charles John Keane. Everyone of consequence in English society was to be there, it was rumored that even Queen Victoria and Prince Albert were to make a public appearance. The custom of the period demanded that everyone be seated before the Queen arrived. So the audience got there a little early, and when the Queen entered her royal box, they observed the convention of standing up and applauding her. The royal couple waited, then bowed. Everyone sat down and the lights were dimmed. Then, suddenly, all eyes turned to a box opposite Queen Victoria's, a woman appeared from the shadows, taking her seat later than the Queen. It was Lola Montez. She wore a diamond tiara on her dark hair and a long fur coat over her shoulders. People whispered in amazement as the ermine cloak was dropped to reveal a low-necked gown of crimson velvet. By turning their heads, the audience could see that the royal couple deliberately avoided looking at Lola's box. They followed Victoria's example, and for the rest of the evening Lola Montez was ignored. After that evening no one in fashionable society dared to be seen with her. All her magnetic powers were reversed. People would flee her sight. Her future in England was finished. Never appear overly greedy for attention, then, for it signals insecurity, and insecurity drives power away. Understand that there are times when it is not in your interest to be the center of attention. When in the presence of a king or queen, for instance, or the equivalent thereof, bow and retreat to the shadows, never compete. 